Frap Moto are proud sponsors of Commentary Corner. Located at 5 Lisburn Road, Moira, the former Motor Shocks building, this is the place to go for something different. Only open two hours a week to the public, Wednesday 6pm till 8pm, everyone is very welcome to drop in and check out the weekly change in stock ranging from mopeds to fireblades. Davey from Brap Moto is looking for all types of motorbikes, vintage, classic, sports bikes to damaged end of life bikes for dismantling. Also job lots of bike spurs. Top cash prices paid, in particular looking for good clean road bikes of any age. Brap Moto is proud to support many racers on the roads and the short circuit. Alright guys welcome to another episode of commentary corner <laughs> i was going to say what number i forget what number what number is this i think this is eight or eight eight is it eight? i think it's eight eight nine eight nine, eight, eight, nine. nine maybe eight, nine. Eight, eight and a half yeah um <laughs> welcome young rossi how's it going buddy good rossi dobson yeah looking forward to this uh thanks for having me uh, no problem no thanks, thanks for having us johnny good man thank you we're here at Vail link in belfast oh great spot like it is. Great spot. And you're obviously a walking fucking advertising board for Feelink. Oh, absolutely. I'm a walking colour in book, as some people call me. A <laughs> walking colour in. <laughs> colour by numbers. Colour by numbers, letters, a few colours. Yes, yeah, so Joy Dunlop there and Robert Dunlop. Yeah. And, and you're getting a few more. Yeah. So I've got uh, Joey's there in the lower arm. I've got a food robber piece up there. It's actually in the background, Darren Lindsay in there. But oh, yeah. We're actually going to take it out, but I actually big fan of that so I won't leave it in all been well I've got William Dunlop going in there and then Michael up there so we'll finish off a pretty cool sleeve probably it is and more to come oh there's pl- plenty more to come we're <laughs> getting started here <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's it like when you're I wanted to get we were talking earlier I wanted to get a, a sleeve years ago when I was racing myself and I was afraid of it coming off in the leathers or you know or putting the leather forgetting about it and then ripping half my arm off you know over the summer but I just never got around to it until I quit racing, so everything's coming together now. What do you get it during the race season? Your tattoos are sort of yeah. I mean, like there there's some points in the year when obviously I can't get tattooed. Like I'll be like talking to Johnny, be like, right, this is sort of what I want, but I can't get it in the next few weeks or whatever. If you've got availability because I'm racing here, then I've got this on, got that on. For like whenever he was down in was Saturday, we were talking about. I don't. We've been talking either way about working on this sleeve, and I was like, right. Here's sort of like the rough time. It'll be it'll suit to get tattooed because I've got this race coming up, got this one, and I don't want to obviously go out sweaty leathers and end up you ruin a new tattoo because it end up it just it destroys the full thing, you know. I end up a mess. Yeah, and that's it's the last thing you need, but it's this good so far. Mm-hmm. And obviously, new sponsor. Yeah, as well. new new sponsor. So I can't thank Johnny and and you know Vale for for coming on. You know, like I've been getting tattooed now for a good while now with Johnny, and obviously. The whole shop, everyone here is they're all bikers, you know, mm-hmm. Glenn, um, Hartley and Johnny are on the bikes. I think Dally as well has definitely had a bike as he's talking about it before. So it's it, it's cool like when you come in to get tattooed and like you're you know say I'm getting tattooed like that other was like near a five hour sitting, but you're in the shop for seven or eight hours, you know, throughout the day. So you get to spend all day talking about motorbikes, it's great. Yeah. I I actually I near shipped whenever I first came here because I came with a I drew one years ago that I wanted to get done and I never got a chance and then the wife she got me a voucher for Christmas and I thought right happy days I'll go down see what the crack is and it was her boss that actually recommended I think he's friendly with one of the guys here so I thought right we'll head down with the voucher and <laughs> we'll give it a go and I give my design to Johnny Johnny put it on the computer next thing sit down I'm not joking I didn't think that I was going to be here oh, you all day. You, yeah. I thought it was a consultation or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I thought, he, he sat me down, next thing he started wiping my arm down and stuff. And I, now to be fair, I did shave, just in case. So <laughs> My arm, that is. <laughs> so, <laughs> so sat down and put the disinfectant and stuff on. I thought, this is happening. I get the first half of this done. Mate, I must have been there for like six hours. Done the whole lot in the one because I never done. I, I didn't know that. You know, it was my first. I was popping my cherry. Well, I had two shitty tattoos when I was sixteen, like. But basically, popping my cherry and I was fucking. I was there for eight hours, like. Oh no, that's that's normal behaviour for a tattoo shop. Oh, I, I didn't know that. 
I know for I know for next time. I well, I've had my first shirt tattoo, so like every every time I come in, like say me and Johnny are like eleven o'clock. I I know we'll not be starting until like one half one because you're getting everything like design worked up and then it's mm-hmm. the shave and the cleaning, letting it sit. You've, there's so much to do, especially like now that I'm. I'm well versed in how it all, and how it all goes. Mm-hmm. I know what they expect when I ring. Like my first couple, I mean, you you spend the whole day just you're just shitting yourself, going like, "How's this gonna feel? How's this oh. gonna look? What's gonna look?" You know. Because of course you're getting it all a new part of your body, aren't you? Really? Yeah, you every every single things. one. Like whenever I was doing that, like that first sleeve, like it's only my first couple of tattoos, so you don't know how it's gonna go, what the pain's gonna be like, how's this, how's that. But as I say, I've I've been around this block a few a yeah, few times, like yeah. so I know what they expect and I know how it always uh, how it turns out. Yeah, do you ever find that people do people judge you at all? If oh, everyone, in, in, especially up, up around your neck and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of my least favorite things to do, and I've said this before, is meet new people. <laughs> I as much as I like meeting people and talking to people, I hate meeting someone who is like sort of against tattoos or like you can see that they're looking at you, you can see the arms or maybe they go like that at you when they're, oh. when they're talking. Then I like they're just judging the life out of me. Yeah. yeah. Or else if you meet someone like so, say if you're toxic, I'm talking to you now and I've never met Neil and, and like, you said to me, oh yeah, he hates tattoos. I'd be like, oh here we go again. <laughs> Next thing you get <laughs> come back. <laughs> you get the question like, you know, so what do your tattoos mean? Why do you have so many? Why this? Why? And you're going like. Leave me alone. It's just, yeah, it's one of them. Where yeah. like you meet someone who has them, it's like, well, it's fine. Yeah, but uh, I I know I get judged quite heavily for them. But without sounding like that, a typical young fellow, I'm not going. Well, I don't care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I genuinely don't. Yeah, you know, and I, I know what they are. I know what they mean. It's something to me. So like, if someone likes them, they like them. If they don't, they don't. You know, it means a yeah. lot. It's yeah. all on their body. Welcome. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Yeah. No, it was, it's now I never judge anybody until I see them and I'm a really good judge of character and another thing that scared me when I walked into here there was these big men with the, all these tattoos and hoops and I thought fucking hell I actually taxed away I said I don't think this is a good idea <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they said but I remember like I, I remember whenever I was getting my first one done again never been to a tattoo I had no like no anything to do with tattoos mm-hmm. I just know people who have them obviously everyone in my family has them bar yeah. my wee brother and I can remember going with my auntie to the shop, not the old shop, but the one like further on down the road. First ever time walking in, and I remember like just going around the back and hear all the needles going and things like that. And I remember just looking around, going, "What is this?" And I remember like the first time when I went down, Johnny wasn't in because we were going to see Johnny about getting booked in, mm-hmm. and the only one in was Glenn. I never met Glenn, but Glenn's got like top the to toe, his face still done, yeah. the whole neck, the throat. And I remember looking at him, going. Oh, what am I in for? <laughs> you know, and, uh, Glenn's one of the loveliest guys I've ever met. Uh, but it, he's like a big teddy bear. Yeah, he's a lo- lovely yeah. guy, but it, it was like the first time I've been in this sort of environment going like, this is definitely a bit of me, but going like, I'm not going for this. <laughs> you know, you can, uh, you can hear a picture of the scene, like a hazy, smoky room <laughs> with all these big biker dudes, you know, and they're looking around at you when you open the door. <laughs> <laughs> You're going like, what, what am I in for? But I mean, like, as I've said, like, sort of touched on it, you know, like I've been coming here or, well, with these sort of guys mm-hmm. that long that, you know, once you get to know them and you spend time with them, you just realise it's just silly as it sounds. They're just normal people. Yeah. They've just got tattoos on them, you know. And yeah. that's the way some people like that with me. They sort of look at me and, I, I mean, I get prejudged all the time. Mm-hmm. And especially if I go somewhere with, I meet new people around my own age. Mm-hmm. Like the amount of people I've met and they go, I thought you'd be an absolute head case, you know, off the rails, doing lines of cooking all that. <laughs> what do you mean? They go, you got neck tattoos? And I go, because I'm neck tattoos doesn't mean I'm a, I'm a looper, yeah, you know? Yeah. You've, you've definitely done time. <laughs> I've actually had that question before when I was going, at the time I'm like, I'm 18. They're going, what? No. I go, oh, I thought you were about 25. <laughs> right, no, 40 age, are you? 19, no. Are you 19 now? Yeah. Oh, are you were right, you said I was 19. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're like the oldest 19 year old I've ever had in my life. You've said that before on commentary. Did I? Yeah. I did, I think I did, yeah, right? Did. <laughs> it, it was Easter Monday. Because I, cause whenever yeah. you think, um, because you went live on YouTube doing the commentary, mm-hmm. and obviously, once the day was done, I went back and listened to Superbike Cup qualifying and the racing things I got there. And I've actually, I swear to God, I've got a screen recording of you calling me the, <laughs> the oldest, you, you, uh, something along the lines of like, oh, he's like, the oldest 18 or 19 year old I've ever met in my life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I screen recorded that and sent it to everyone. Brilliant. Everyone. See, to be honest, I don't remember anything that I say in commentary. Like, <laughs> I suppose you got like a full day of it, you know? Uh, yeah, just like, see from start to finish. Even we do some roundup um, podcasts. 
and I have to look back and Richard he gives me all the time sheets and I stuff them in my bag and like half an hour before he comes to do a roundup podcast I'm who done what I can't remember anything like, I just, got just a, a long day of racing I suppose you're sitting there looking at time sheets and you're looking at people out in the bags and you've so much going on through it's, one day you oh, can't remember melt. a thing it is melting like, I, I couldn't and your head starts to get sore around about four o'clock or so and you're like Fuck, please no red flags I need to get home <laughs> and then of course there's usually a red flag for fuck's sake but We'll talk a wee bit about motorbikes <laughs> on that note. I think that's what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, to me, you nearly came out of the blue, like out of nowhere. Like the talent, how long have you been racing now? Uh, I've been riding for 15 years, racing for 14. Jesus Christ. I didn't know that. I'm, and I apologise. I never watched <laughs> racing when I raced. You know, you're probably the same. You don't watch much racing, like, but unless your brother's out or whatnot. But I didn't. I recognise your dad. Yeah. Whenever I seen him coming back into the paddock, and there was this wee, wee scumba- small fat man, some wee scumbag <laughs> with tattoos <laughs> along with him, <laughs> and I was like, I know a fellow. And your dad used to race as well. Yeah, my my dad raced uh, late nineties and then went to the roads in the two thousands. Mm-hmm. So whenever I came along, he'd been off a bike for about 13, 14 years. Right. So, you know he's. Put a few stone on, hasn't really looked much different, you know. <laughs> I know he, you know, maybe grew a beard or something. So whenever we like initially went back into the short circuit scene, you would see a lot of people stop him and recognise him and talk to him and things like that. Uh, there, yeah. you know. So I, I know what you mean. As in, a lot of people like might know the face or know the name or something like I can still remember like my first couple of rounds and people would like, look at him and look at him and h- him being a he's, he's typically he's Belfast. Going, what are you looking at? <laughs> and then the, the Falcons were going, you want a photo? Are you Sammy? And the next thing, you know, okay, I remember you from X uh, amount of years ago. Yeah, I recognise him with, you know, like the Derek Young days and the, uh, he raced with my Uncle Trevor and stuff. Yeah. And honestly, I didn't think he was as good as what he was. <laughs> <laughs> How like funny. Multiple you, podiums and yeah. real good 250 rider. Like. Uh, you, you mentioned your, your your uncle. Like, I mean, one of, one of the things me and I have done for years, like, I mean, we've been on the road hundreds maybe even thousands of times you go and practice and racing and i love hearing his stories from his days and he would mention trevor quite a lot right. obviously at this point i'm only a kid racing motocross so i wouldn't have known who he was oh, just true. know the name now obviously when i came on the circuit scene you would have been sort of finishing up because mm. i came on in 2019 and i can i remember you in the 350 yeah and obviously i'm a two-stroke fanatic so i'm going who's that guy in the 350 and then my dad was like, what's his name? I said, Gareth Keyes. And I remember my dad saying to me, I wonder if he's anything to do with Trevor Keyes. Oh, and I go, is that the fellow you used to race? Oh, yeah, yeah. And obviously at the time, I wouldn't have known anybody. Is that ever. the fellow that comes off all the time? <laughs> <laughs> the fellow who laid one up at Turner Gruff. Uh, <laughs> That's the grand free I've seen the video. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was embarrassing. That was a mere cat moment. Dad. I thought I was safe to be fair. But the road, whenever I left the road at Dundrod, because she took the front on the way in. Yeah. And then I stood it up. And as soon as I got on the grass bank, I thought, fuck, I'm safe. Head for, there's a big bale on the right hand side. Just cut the corner and head for it straight. Next thing, the bike disappeared from b- below me. There's a big shock you went for down. drainage. And the bike went down the shock and I just went, and it, the bike catapulted up in the air, went over the top of Sean Anderson. Because he said, he came back in with that and he says, what shape's the wee bike in? He says, oh, it's not too bad, you know, because they're only light. And he says, I thought it was going to be worse than that because I looked up like this. I went sailing. And it went sailing up <laughs> over the top of me like, and landed in the shock door side of the road. But yeah, I know I've had plenty of embarrassment moments. <laughs> Have we all? <laughs> but your you're dad racing, uh, was there ever. You obviously you went to the racing nope. with your dad? No. 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 At all. My, my, whenever I was born, I was born in 05. My dad got a put in the Northwest that year. Had a decent enough year, I think. But that's that was his highlight of the year. <laughs> and they had said to me that after that time, me being born and stuff, his sort of mindset changed on really? and, and the whole whole race, not just roads, racing in general. And I don't know much about the se- the, the rest of the season after that, but I remember him telling me in 06. So like officially he sort of finished after Northwest in 05. Oh. And he was so 06 it came, new season. He had been on the no no bag time, no nothing, but Northwest was coming up. And the way he sort of tells me the story is that he was sort of in two minds, do I do it, do I not? And he went to a Kirkson track day, 
So I get some laps, try to get a feeling back on the motorbike and whatnot. And so it was just him, and I think maybe, maybe the, the Yeti was with him. I don't know, but I'm near sure he was. And so it was just normal Kirkson track day, bike out of the van whenever tire warmers on the way you go. And my dad's generator, he had told me that the generator can trip but doesn't turn off. So the generator's constantly running, oh. but it's not powering. So he had left pit lane, and he had said, like, he went into Colonial, and the bike's, like, stepping out, and, you know, freezing cold, oh, 250 oh, no. selection. You'll know what it's like. Yeah. And he's sort of going, like, well, this is weird, but he, he told me, like, he just thought he'd been off a bike that long, right, okay, I'll just shake it off, get back in the groove, and done his lap. And he said he was coming into Shakira, and he was like, right, second lap, right, let's try and not go in man, because you're on cold tires, but let's get a bit of hate in these tires, let's get going. And he went through the chicane, hit the gas, boom, oh. sent to the moon, cold tire. Didn't realise that the generator had tripped, so there was no part in it in tire warmers, but uh, it kept running. Just ripped the tire warmers off. And he took a big whack, and I don't think he had any broken bones or anything like that. He might have, but I don't think he did. But he took a big enough whack that he had to sort of go, don't know about this. Went down northwest, and he just, he told me he was going down towards university, and was just thinking, why am I doing this? Why am I here? What's, yeah. what, what am I doing? And I sort of got he, he, I don't know whether it was the race or practice. If I feel it was the practice, he'll obviously tell me when I ask him. But he just pulled in, said to his dad, my, my granddad, stick that thing in the back of the van. That's me. Let's go to the bar. Jesus Christ. And that was it. Just like that. And he's never rode a bike since. Wow. Never. And he never, look, never looked back. But uh-huh. to be honest, well, this is going to sound quite cruel, but it's just the black and white of it. There was too many people being wiped out on the roads mm-hmm. with young families. Yeah. So at this point, my dad had me and my older brother. My older brother would have been five, maybe six. I was only a baby. And he was good friends of people like Richard Britton, Darren Lindsay. And he was seeing what, how, how, how their families were being left oh, yeah. after what, what had happened to them. And he was going, I don't want my son growing up mm-hmm. without a dad. Yeah. So that's why he packed it in. And he's never even considered riding a bike since. He wanted me to just, he wanted me to, grew up and him being there you know so yeah yeah that's that's why he packed it in then obviously I, I'd, I'd come along a few years after uh, and did he ever th- like try and stop you from racing yourself or no um funny i was actually thinking this on the way up because i had a feeling you might sort of touch on that it's, it's a strange how it comes about like i'm i'm named rossi my dad mm-hmm. used to race you know people sort of think that i was just natural he's gonna be able to race right? yeah. it's not like that at all you know whenever i was very young before i could speak my dad would tell me that, he would tell me this, like, in sort of recent months that if I would see a motorbike, whether it's on TV or out in, out in public, I would just make noises and point at it. I, not even motorbike noises, like just noises because I couldn't speak or nothing. I still do. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> so I was, I clearly had some sort of interest in them. I don't know whether it was just things with an engine or two wheels, I don't know. But like my, my granny and stuff used to buy me like these wee cheap one pound toys and I would like spin the wheels and I clearly had some sort of interest in it, and then from about three, four years old, there was a, this is how old my dad is, there's a tape, not even a DVD, but a tape of the 2002 Modern Road Races. He's and getting it, on like tapes for fucking... I know, it's not that old. Years ago. Well, that's how they're fucking me. <laughs> and, um, I still have tapes. <laughs> that's just showing your age. I'm only a pop. <laughs> and, um... I so from 02, one hundred races, and he's in the two fifty race, and he was leading it. He ended up finishing second, but because he was leading it, he was getting obviously all the coverage. So, me as a kid, I'm probably just going, "That's my daddy." Mm-hmm. So I watched it on repeat every single day. I had like a sweet tape player thing in my room. How one of my aunties, every time like my auntie, if anyone knows me well enough to know that I am my auntie's golden boy, right. and every time I go to hers, put the tape on, say it's two or three hours long, mm-hmm. finish it. Let's yeah, rewatch it, and I done that every night. Turn it as, over as, as, as just a wee kid. Brilliant. Prob- probably just like looking at it, going, "That's my daddy," you know, that, yeah. that sort of thing. And that's where I think, me in my own head, that's where the interest would have begun from. Never mind, me and my dad used to watch all the MotoGPs every weekend. You know, from Friday first practice to the Grand Prix on the Sunday, watched every single bit of it. But there was never this like oh, let's push Rossi down there. Or there was never that, me as a kid going, oh, I want to do it. It was just the way life was. Mm-hmm. And then it wasn't until I got my first bicycle. And it was just, it 
a very typical first bike story as a kid, you know, one stabilizers and you ride around a bit. Next thing you know, like they, they come off and you, you get that all well hold on the next thing you let go. Oh, and that was the sort of thing how I first got on the motorbike because my got a bicycle and my dad said like just watching me in the street play on it. The way I was riding it with stabilizers, he's like, I'm gonna take them off. So he took them off, did the whole, I'm gonna hold on to you, just you keep pedaling, not let go, let go. And he, he says that. Fucking liars. When, when, whenever, <laughs> fucking liars, right? <laughs> he says, whenever, whenever he let go, I, I don't know, I must have felt his hand not being like in the back of the seat or something. Yeah. I'd turn around and the fear of God was in my face. Oh, but, but, but he said, just keep going, just keep going. And I did. And he says, like, within 10, 15 minutes. You had your knee down. Well, I wish. <laughs> he, he was like. I was, I was racing people in the street, I was getting down curves, I was trying to do jump stuff. So we yeah. said something along the lines of mum, like, I'm going to put him in that bike. So my brother had a PBW in the back garden, mm -hmm. in our shed. He had read it once when he was, I don't know, two or three years old, Christ it, never again. And mm -hmm. it just sat there. And there was no intention of over keep out for a Rossi, because whenever my brother took it out, I wasn't even born. So yeah. it wasn't as if, oh, well, sure, give it elsewhere, you know. So... That's how I came. I had a wee motocross student all the time. Just probably just more of a gimmick, just to have one. Went out the back into the back garden, put the thing in the stand. I don't know what he was doing. Probably just filling up a fuel, maybe just checking the order, whatever in it. Mm -hmm. And I remember him putting it on the stand. There's quite high stands in the thing, so the back wheels off the ground. Oh yeah. So I remember him teaching me what, what we would call throttle control. Mm -hmm. And I remember him absolutely drilling into me, on off, on off, and I was sitting on the stand making sure I was doing it on off, on off. And I can even remember, like four years old, knowing in my head, okay, I, I know what I'm doing here, on, off, on, off. Mm -hmm. And it went, went out the back of my house. It's now a rugby pitch, but it's, it was just a big grass sort of field, real, real deep sand in it. So we pee, we, we baby motocross bike, it probably suited the ground. Mm -hmm. And I just took off. And obviously only ever watching road bikes and MotoGP all my life, I went to turn around trying to stick a knee down. <laughs> <laughs> now, whether I stayed on it, having a clue. <laughs> and I don't have that very many memories from it. I can remember being in the back garden doing that on off thing and I can, my first actual memory of it is crashing and I crashed on my first day on the thing. Um, no idea how it happened but my dad said somehow I high sided it. Yeah. I'm probably the first person on earth to high side a PW50 but I can remember like whenever I was on the ground crying my eyes out not because I was in pain or nothing because my mouth was filled with sand. Oh. <laughs> so he's, he's running after me my next door neighbour she's absolutely shitting herself going oh no he's all hurt he's all hurt and I just remember crying because there was sand in my mouth and that was the first time I ever rode a motorbike. And then, at five years old, I went to do my first race. But my dad had been out of the scene at that point for, I don't know, what was that, 2009, so probably three or four years. Mm -hmm. But he had never been in the motocross scene, so he had no idea what age he can start and all. So at five years old, took me to SB Grass Track. Organizer said, look, he can't race, he's, he's not six. That's obviously the, the legal age. But I think, I think it, it didn't like sweet talk the guy, but he just got like a one-off as and look, we'll let you race this one time. Yeah. Don't come back till he's six. Right. So I did that first race. Have some sort of vague memories from it, but nothing worth talking about. And then six years old, got a wee mini venture, which is a proper KTM fifty. Right. And that was my first proper race bike. And then from then on, it went from then to now, pretty much. Holy shit! So you started basically six year old. Your yeah. first race season. Yeah, first first proper race season. Six years old. First race at five. But I don't even think I did like a full season. I think I can remember as a. Not the field that I first started on, but a field like beside it. Mm -hmm. There was not like a motorbike track, but there was people just on me pit bikes, just mucking about. Yeah, who would have just went round and like in this and make wee shapes and like made a track. Mm -hmm. And it was only a hundred yards from my house, so we yeah, we went around there, around there and just sort of learned, just riding around, just as as you do. But for whatever reason, I hated that bike. Don't know what it was. Mm -hmm. I can't remember hating it, but my dad said it did. And the thing laid up parked for ages. I had no intentions of riding it. And I think it's something along the lines of like, I just went to my dad one day and said, can I ride that? Mm -hmm. And I did. And that was the point, at that point, that was when I, I knew in head, I go, that's when I started. Yeah. Because I've never stopped since then. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I think my dad said it was laid off for like seven or eight months or something. So even when I was six, I missed most of that race season. Not with any real intentions of race or anything like that. It was just more like... Sure, we can do. We brought out here, brought out there. It oh. wasn't like, oh, you're gonna be a world champ. It wasn't gonna be like that. Not, yeah. It wasn't like Project Ross. Every weekend, like, right? You know, it wasn't yeah. like it was just a, a kid on his motorbike. So I don't, I don't even remember if we did many races when I was six. I, I know a, a few off the top of my head, but I definitely didn't do a lot. And then turning sevens when 
I went on and, and, and started and haven't stopped since. Yeah. And how many years did you do motocross then? I stopped when I was 13, which was the end of 2017. So unofficially, if you want to say starting from five, eight years, but I would say six or seven proper years. Yeah, yeah. 2017. That would have been... You would have done the transition to tarmac yeah. on, what, a 300? No, 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 mini bikes. Oh, you don't know. I, I did it before, yeah. So, so what had happened, oh, the, the right. motocross thing was, motocross has never been my sport. Mm -hmm. I've, I've never had interest in it. In all the years, I had no interest in watching it, no nothing. I loved doing it. Really, really, really enjoyed racing Aye. it, practicing. Loved riding the bike. I loved doing everything about it, but I just, no interest in the sport. Like, I, I would go to a race, and obviously when everyone's young, you know, haven't really got many big rivals or fallouts. So, like, you know, there's 10 or 15 young ones running about the paddock and it's, oh, did you see the Supercross? Did you see the MXGP? And I'm just oh, sitting there going, yeah. no, I watched Valentino beat Lorenzo. You know, that's, oh, that's, that's yeah. what I was doing, you know. Yeah. So I think, to be honest, it sort of caught up to me because not without, I'm, I'm not blowing smoke up my own arse, but I, I was quite successful at motocross. I think I'd won seven or eight championships in my years, you know, and every bike I was on, my last year or so on it, that's when I'd won everything. Mm -hmm. So I sort of built a bit of time on the 50, built a bit of time in 65. And then in my last year in all of them, it was like championship, championship, championship. And it wasn't like you're going to win them. It just happened because I sort of served my time learning how to do it. And then it all sort of fell into place in the last year. And I, I've done, I would say two years, maybe a year and a half of British championship in the motocross. And to be honest, I scared a shit out of me. Yeah. I think it was because you're going over to England and they're like nearly professionals sort of yeah you know you're used to motocross over here rock up on a saturday morning and that was just the way it is you went and raced you know you're packing up at three three o'clock in the afternoon back home where you go over there it's a few days before you, you're everyone's been on the track you rock up it's like three bikes in the awning for one rider a big massive sixty thousand pound mm. hours you're going what's this about and you know i'm sure we'll get into this probably a bit more as we go on but even motocross it's all money yeah so Dad's not on a budget, he's just on whatever we can afford. My granda sponsored me, I, just said, I wouldn't say sponsor, but probably technically that's probably the right word to use, mm -hmm. you know, paid a lot yeah. to have me there. And without sort of sounding depressed or whatever, he was sort of come to the end of his life mm -hmm. and eventually died. That definitely played a part on me. And then going to race British motocross, it was all stress, stress, stress. and. I was stressed and my dad was, and I had to try and put on this face that it was 100% I was fine. Yeah. And I hated it. Yeah. Deep down I hated it. And there wasn't one race. I think it was something real, real stupid. Like, I'm going to give you just random figures here, but it was something like this. Like, say out of 20 races I did, 17 of them fell first lap. Holy shit. And that was for no other reason than I was just so nervous, so agitated yeah. that... And you had the mask on just to try and... Yeah. And I, it was just like, once I fell off and got back on, at pace, yeah. you know, and like, you know, my first couple of rounds, of, I would qualify fairly well for never seeing the track while everyone else had been practicing on two or three days that way. Because the motocross is not like circuits where you might get a test day the day before or something. Mm -hmm. You can be on that track all week and then go race at it. Oh, right, so yeah. you know what the story is. And I think my first ever British race, I qualified 12th. Only reason I know that is because there's a photo of me on the dummy grin, there's a wee 12 beside it. Mm -hmm. you know, so it wasn't as if I was super slow, but I mean, I was bottom half of the results every race simply because i fell off the first lap shit myself and then you know that that was how it went mm -hmm. and then i could never understand motocross and the qualifying because you all line up in a fucking straight line anyway oh yeah, yeah just i know, I know. It's, it's, it's more to just pick your gate it's just like a free practice it, you know I mean. say say your, your turn's a right hander and some people like to go super tight squared off i always like to like sweep in it so to well, be so honest, you, you get a choice of gate. Well, that's, that's what it is. So if you oh, qualify really? first, okay. first choice you get. There's 40 gates, go where you want. Oh, really? And that's, that's, that's how qualifying works. We're obviously on circuits, it's it, one, two, three, four. It's very obvious, you know. Yeah. But at the end of my last year in 65, I was Ulster and Irish champion. And I was cooking. You know, I was, I was going real well. As I say, hating British championship, but I've come over at home. And because there was the same stresses, I could go out. And again, without sounding like I'm up my own horse, I could just dominate. See, after the first lap, boom, checked yeah. out. You know, I could break 11 or 12 seconds in the first two or three laps. And see, at that point, it's just watching the pit board. <laughs> you know, take, take the pace down, just watch the board. Yeah. Say it's plus 10, okay, next lap, plus 10. Maybe drop down to plus 8, okay, go back up. Yeah, and that's, that was how I did it. And at Jeez. the end of my last year in 65, we were talking about going European. Mm -hmm. And I just remember going, no. Yeah. I don't want to do it. Simply just because I didn't 
have the mindset to go and race at those higher levels. And we ended up going 85. Um, we got a TM, which are, no one really gets TMs. Mm. When you move up this 85, most people are 150 Honda, KTM or Husqvarna. That's what, you, that was just what everyone went for. We went for a TM. I really liked it, mm -hmm. but my dad, knowing me, sort of never thought the chassis suited me and this, that and the other and things didn't. He, he knows me as a rider at that time better than I did. Right. So he would look at it and go, no, that's not right. You could probably do this, could probably do that. But the 85 clicked right away. Mm -hmm. And you know, within my first year, I was on the podium in Ulster Championship. I was running at the front of Irish. I think I might've won a couple of Irish rounds, which at that point for me, on the 50 or 65, it would never have happened. First year, you're always way down. Second year, a bit higher. Third year was cooking. Yeah were on the 85 right away it was like this is all good and then next thing you know it's like dad this isn't for me heart's not <laughs> in it and i can remember the day standing in the living room with my mom and my dad pretty much telling i don't want to do this anymore yeah and i remember sort of not crying but sort of like tearing up and stuff not because i was quitting or anything like that there i just knew like you spent all these years very successful years to throw it all away and i think that's what my dad sort of thought i was yeah. like no i want something new and i knew in the back of my head circuits yeah and that was always my my thing my thing's always been roads but obviously when you're 13 it's not going to be roads it's going to be circuits and i think to be honest my best mate in life jamie lands had a big impact on that because he yeah. had he had broke his hip in 2015 16 at, at british mm -hmm. and because of his hip injury no he, he dislocated it and um he had went to circuits because he couldn't ride motocross anymore. So I would go to a lot more circuit races in 2017. And I'm sitting there watching him on a wee one-time favorite pretty league going, he's living my dream. Yeah. Everything he was doing, I'm just going, that's my dream. That's what I need to do. That's, that's my thing. And I'm, I wasn't like never, I was never jealous when I got off him, but I was just looking at him, just envying everything and going, that's what I need to do. And I think I played a big part in me going, that's what my new challenge has got to be. Um, Remember Gavin Johnson? You might have raced oh, him, yeah. Oh, yeah. He he lives up the street from me, and he had retired, and was buying these like me one forty pit bikes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, these absolutely scrap heaps, but stripping them down and making them in these supermotos. I never heard of pit bikes like with supermoto wheels and going, oh. what's this for? And he would have shown me like photos and stuff of like going around the knee down and going, that's like circuit racing. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I can remember the last ever motocross race, only a wee grass track, but a crack, and this new. Mini bike championship came about IMC. Yeah. Never heard of it. Yeah. No idea. No idea what it was. And uh, the Boyd family who run the championship and started it up. I remember Michelle telling me, "Well, we're practicing day in three weeks." And I remember saying, "But Dad, can we do that?" And he was going, "No, if you want." <laughs> and I can still remember as clear as day for three weeks. It was the longest three weeks of my life. Yeah, that's all I thought just about. Just wanted to get day, out. I just wanted to do it. And Stevie Lance, Jimmy's dad, had sourced me leathers boots and gloves off some boy over in england that he had met so he, we i remember meeting him he was going to I think northern ireland match or something so he's in belfast got this big massive box all the gear was there and i was like okay it's it's sort of becoming a reality this is helpful. and i think my dad sort of said yes as in you can do that but not thinking follow through like i right, sure we'll give it a go but i never i don't think that he understood how much i really wanted to do it right and Gavin had said to me, sure, take one of my bikes. Mm -hmm. So we we're going, happy days, brilliant. The day before, I put all my stuff on, just trying it all on, whatnot. And my dad was like, don't take this thing for a spin. Just not even to get a feel for it, but just understand what you're sort of going to be doing. Like, I'd never had a front brake in my life. <laughs> I don't ever use back, you know, really silly things like that. Yeah, yeah. So I had the back of my house, this big lane that joins two schools, but it's only just this lane. It's not like really. You don't really get much public on it, no. and you don't really get any more cars. Maybe like the old dog walker or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I took it up this lane, just up and down and up and down, and the gearbox jammed. Oh, got the shit. got to the top of the hill, <laughs> and I just I remember putting the clutch in, but there was no freeway. I'm going that's gearbox. Yeah, and I'm waving down to that. Come up, I can't push this thing. Oh. And we ended up getting it back to the house, and I can remember saying, "Are we still going the mar?" No one at the top of my head. This thing's rode off, and he's mm -hmm. going. No, we can't have to give it a miss. And I can remember 13-year-old me and all my leathers, all the gear, I started to cry. Just because I, I was so disappointed because I was like, I waited all this time, all sort of all, all my days to make my first ever day on tarmac. 
from no one three weeks before. You know, we're on day 20 out of 21. <laughs> this is going to happen. <laughs> oh, Next thing is, oh yeah, we're not doing it. And I, oh, I can remember crying. I was so disappointed. And then my dad was like, right, I'll see what we can do. And I think he spoke to Crystal Black. And at that time, I probably wouldn't even knew Crystal. Mm-hmm. And Jimmy Coates was hiring bike site. At this point, I'd never met Jimmy. I don't think my dad ever met him. Obviously, I'd met early and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it was just this fella coming. You rent the bike off him. I think it was 150 quid or something for the day. Right, that's all day. Go for it. And my first day on tarmac was nothing but a disaster. <laughs> first lap, I took off. The thing ran out of fuel. But we thought something was wrong with the bike. So I missed the first session. Mm-hmm. Second session, went out in this bike. And it broke down at turn two. Third session, I was getting this different bike. And I remember starting it up with my dad and this big rattle off the thing. And I remember my dad going, I'm not putting you on that. No. So I missed that session. Took a KO mini GP out, got the turn two again. I, at this point, I probably completed like one lap in my very first ever lap. And I'm going, what's going on? <laughs> Tried taking a mini motorway, away. Left pit lane, couldn't get my foot in the pegs. So I wobbled around, got a lap, pulled back into the pits. This, is, this is nothing but a disaster. Like, And then it was um, Johnny Rainey gave me his his pit bike is going look there's nothing wrong with that there take that alright it, it'll not break down or whatever so I got two sessions and it was the most fun I ever had yeah. and I remember going this is for me and I was brutal I, I was so slow you know, it's like some people go out their first day and like they might show signs of ability or a bit of talent me not even any of it mm-hmm. it looked horrible like I was actually looking through photos the other day of my first day it looks so wrong and then that was my first ever run on tarmac and that's when I made the decision this is what I want to do Mm-hmm. Um, I remember my dad being a bit like, you sure? You know, he, he was still sort of going, motocross, motocross, because yeah. you were going so well and stuff. And I was like, no. Your dad was like, I know we called you, Rossi, but like, <laughs> mate, you're shit. <laughs> I, I, I would say... Back to the rugby pitch <laughs> on the peewee pitch. I would say he probably wanted to say it a few times, because whenever I made the choice, and this is what I'd want to do, we got that big bike of Gavin's fixed up. And Gavin's like, I don't know, six foot, whatever. At this point, I'm probably, I don't know, five, two, five, three, and we mm-hmm. smoldered. But his bike was raised up, oh, so right. I couldn't touch the ground. I had to cut the seat, and the bars were high. The thing was an absolute mess, you know, for me. Yeah. So I took it out for a couple of track days and wobbled around, and it wasn't for me. And I remember my dad being like, you sure about this? You sure about this? And I said, yep. So we got a got our own bike. We small frame, and my first two runs on it, slow as hell. Mm-hmm. I'd shown no signs of any improvement, no nothing. I can remember coming in one of the sessions, and my dad sort of, not give me a bollocking because he, ne- he never really has, but sort of had a bit of a go at me saying, like, you've made a mistake. Oh, yeah. You've made a mistake. We need yeah. to go back to the motocross. I can make a phone call and have that TM back in no time. <laughs> and I remember going, no, this is what I want to do. And it was the, the track day after that. So it was two wet days and then we had two dry days. And the next dry day, I made a wee bit of progress, starting to develop a bit of a style. Not in terms of, like, putting my knee down or nothing, but you could see I was, the bike was, I, I was flowing with the bike. Where before, like, the bike was down here and I was, sitting up and didn't know how to go in the corner and it was enough for me to go right it's a bit better it's a bit better mm-hmm. and the, the day the next the day after the the next practice day was the day before the first ever race weekend and it was the first time i got my knee down and i can remember like we, we got the pegs raised because i was scraping the life out of them so i was carrying like decently an angle got the pegs raised I remember going around put my knee down for the first ever time and i can remember screaming at my helmet couldn't believe it <laughs> scared the shit out of you. no 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 but i was like i am buzzing that's oh, my yeah? that's my life can pick up my knee down <laughs> and at that point i was starting to you, you could see visual improvement okay it's it's not bad but it, it's sort of getting there went to the bishop's court for my first ever round one first three races one rider of the day things like that and from that point that was it holy shit that's where i am i've shown enough mm-hmm sort of improvement the last couple of days that for the general person watching it wasn't that fast but it was fast enough to win the kids race i was yeah. only 13 so i was a kid myself and when i won the first three races it was like this is it this is what we're doing mm-hmm. and then it, it stuck ever since there, there was never no you sure about this it was ah, it just clicked with you and that was it. Th- this is what we're doing now and i ended up i don't know how many races i won that year but by the end of the year i won the irish championship and then they had like a winter series i won the winter series championship but I think the big thing that stood out was uh, my first ever, so there were two championships. You had the IMC, which I was a kid rider in, mm-hmm. and then you had the other championship, which I was an adult in. First ever race was in the Bees, and I was like sort of mid-pack in the Bees, nothing special. But when I went back to that other championship, midway through the season, I was qualifying in the front of the A race. 
So with oh, the, right. you know, the best pit bike riders in the country. Yeah. And I was running at the front of them and it was like, okay, there's there's a wee bit of potential here. Obviously at this point I hadn't won anything new championship wise, yeah. but finishing my first year, winning two championships, it was like, okay, I've done enough and I've improved enough that there's not there's a future in this. Not necessarily like there's a future as in, oh I can be something special, not like that, but there's a future in terms of right. I can ride a tarmac bike, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like I'm like a fish out of fish out of water. So that was the end of 2018 and the next thing I was right on the circuits now, 2019, let's, let's get a 300. Yeah. And that was, and that's where I've remained ever since in circuits. Brilliant. And you, you were, that was 2018. Yeah. So it wasn't that long then after that, obviously with the dreaded COVID and whatnot, but technically then it wasn't long after until you'd made it over across the water yeah the so BSB paddock yeah I had done my first ever year on circuits and uh, so we got an R, an R3 and I can remember like deciding what bike we wanted because these 400s Kawasaki's new thing being built and Coatsy was getting one for a race mm -hmm. and I can remember we had booked Spain three days in Monte Blanco and the only reason I didn't want a Kawasaki was because we had no spurs so I remember thinking what if I crash on day one what do you mean you had no spurs as in like you Bu building the bike into a race bike will cost yes. so much that you right. you, you can have basic spurs and sprocks and things ah, like that. But I mean yeah. like fur and handlebars, the yeah. whole lot. We wouldn't have had any of that. All the sticky out bits that break yeah. all the time. And I remember thinking, <laughs> if I crash, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to ruin Spain on day one. Yeah. And I remember seeing this horse three for sale and it came with all the spurs. And I remember going, that's the bike for me. Yeah. And I don't know how I talked my dad into it. That's not the way I talked him into it, by the way. Get <laughs> yeah, me up, big now, daddy. <laughs> but in, the, in the back of my mind, I was going, okay, okay. Load the spurs, so if I bend this thing, I'll, I might get back out. Yeah. And Spain was all right, you know, I was just like any other kid in their first couple of days in the big bike. Went did the first couple of rounds, it was, was all right, you know, I wasn't embarrassing myself. Mm. And the R3, tremendous handling bike, but there's no speed, the thing was slow as can be. Mm -hmm. So... Because it only sort of came out in sort of the R3, yeah, didn't it? Yeah, that, I think it was a 20, it was a fairly fresh bike at the mm -hmm. time, I think it was a 2016 bike, yeah. so it wasn't that old. Mm -hmm. And it was a good bike for what it was, but it just didn't have the legs in the 400s. Not that there was many 400s, maybe one or two, but the thing just didn't have legs in general. And, mm. you know, I was, I was good and all through the corners, but didn't have the legs on it, on the straights. And we were sort of talking about, right, we'll get one of these 400s, see what we can do with it. Um, so we ordered one in, talked to the Elke. He was like, I'll build it, we'll get it. And at that point, Bob Wiley had approached me about riding the Moto3. That's right. Yeah. So... I took it out for a track day, and at, at, at that point, I had always wanted to ride a 125 GP. Yeah. I'm a two-stroke person. A two stroke, 125, yeah. 250, they're my thing. You know, if someone says to me now, what's your dream bike? It's not a Moto GP bike, it's a 250 Honda, yeah. you know? Yeah. So this was my first chance to ride, like a 125, similar sort of thing. Ah, it's a Moto yeah, 3, but the same chassis, three, you know, sort of. the whole thing. And I took it out of the track day at Bishop's Court, and I remember going, oh, that thing's awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, I was so uncomfortable on it, but I remember going, I love that. And Bob was like, well, do you want to race it? So I parked up the 300 to build this new 400, took the Moto3 out, first couple of races, podiums, and next thing the wind started to come along. The lap times weren't horrendous, they were, they were fairly decent at the time. So I'd done like a few rounds in the Moto3 and continued on. So I'd done about half a season in the Moto3. By the time we got the 400 built, I'd missed probably a third of the season on it. So it wasn't as if I was like in contesting for championships, not that I wanted to be in my first year, I just wanted to go out and learn and see what I could do. Yeah. And then towards the later stage of the season, I was on both bikes, 400 Moto3, and the 400 was started to get it working at this time in the Moto3, I was winning races, I was, I was winning most of them, you know, I think at one point I won like five out of six races, so obviously there's only two races at each, each, uh, each Ulster round, mm -hmm. so I'd won pretty much three rounds in a row, bar one race where I crashed, so riding the 400 at the same time, getting podiums, you know, the, the, the racing was, was good, mm -hmm. you know, I was, I was I was the only rider in that year, as a rookie, to win on two different classes of bike and two different manufacturers as well. So it was quite a cool yeah. thing to, to, to take with me. Um, and of course, the two, like, all right, they're two smaller machines, but like the the Moto Three machine is a hell of a lot lighter oh, and yeah. it, a lot more nimble. The tires are skinnier. Po polar opposite it, bikes, even yeah. to get used to that. Yeah, you know, and it's good to see because a lot of young Riders coming up now, they're riding the one bike, and that is it. Yeah. yeah. Like you get, for example, there's today, Michael Dunlop, 
27 wins. Absolute goat. Well done, Michael, by the way. And not that he listens to this podcast. <laughs> no, I don't think he does. <laughs> but anyway, oh, Connor Cummins listens to it. Oh, he, he's yeah, a fan. Maybe he's like a yeah. for us. I, he, he, yeah. he, I tell Michael, well done. <laughs> <laughs> I, but he, like they're riding 125, 250. It seems Robert and Joey. Aye, they can do all different classes, yeah, whereas yeah, yeah, a lot of people don't do that now. Everything. Yeah. yeah. And it was, it's probably because more of the cost of things. Yeah, well, you know? yeah. Like we bought our first one two five, I think it was like three hundred quid or something or five hundred quid. So the road runner one? Uh, Aye. Yeah. Um, Did he get a set of tires these days? No, he wouldn't, <laughs> no. he wouldn't get a set of tires for. We ran the same tires for six years for folks. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck I wish I could. I got about six laps. Uh, Aye. Sick. Uh, it's too expensive now to do yeah. But yeah, but to even get the hang of the machine, you know, I know what the like likes me and you, we rode multiple machines, yeah. you know, it doesn't sound like much, but for someone who has never done that, yeah, it is it's difficult. It's a difficult thing. That, it's yeah. just adapting. Mm-hmm. You know, if you know one bike, then you go to the next one, and you know the other one too. It's just, it's... You're just it's, putting on a new suit sort yeah, of thing? Or it, it's not like, like people sort of think, oh, it's adapting to two different bikes. It's not, it's two different styles. Mm-hmm. A Moto 3, 125, you'll know yourself. You've read small bikes and bikes, you'll know, like, the small bikes are all corner speed, super late braking, but it's all about momentum, keeping it going. Yeah. The 400s are 50, 60 kilo heavier, and you try to ride them similarly, but... The whole way you break, how you throw the thing into a corner, everything's so much different. But it's like having two pairs of old slippers. You know this one, you know that one. Yeah. So it's like, go out in this bike, do what you got to do. And then on the warm lap, it's like, okay, let's readjust a different one. Yeah. And by the time you go from lap one, you know what you're riding, you know what it is. Yeah. Or if it's like two bikes you've never rode before, your head will be fried. <laughs> you know? Take half a, half a race to get oh, the hang of it. Oh, like. 100%, yeah. But well, it takes you like maybe three or four corners yeah. and you're like right I know what I'm on here right? yeah you know what you're doing yeah but, so you were saying the British for your motocross yeah compare that to the British short circuits then night. yeah so when we decided that we're going to go back and at this point we had got our own Moto3 and this new British Talent Cup thing was coming about and we're like it's British Championship if we're going to do it we're going to do it and we'd only originally planned to do about half the season and Thankfully, the whole COVID thing only made it half a season. So we got mm-hmm. technically a full season. It was only five rounds. Mm-hmm. And I remember my dad talking about it and wanting to do it. And I remember him telling me, are you okay with this? And I remember having the, the, the conversation similar to what we're having now, like as in the whole mental side of it, and going, mm-hmm. I'm ready for it. I know what they expect. I know what's going to be there. Yes. I've been there and done it before. I've made the mistakes. So I knew what they expect. And like from round one, it never fazed me. You know, the only, the only difference was that you know, you're you're watching the world's fastest road racer Peter Hickman walk by and say hello there, you're going, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where you usually see these people on TV. That was the only difference for me, you know, from a, like a mental setup. I, I could have went, no problem. It, it wasn't like lying up in bed at night, you know, worrying, and going, oh, God, I've got this tomorrow, I've got that. Or it, it sort of just came second nature. Mm-hmm. So I was very, very comfortable racing the British paddock. Um, you only you only went three hundred, didn't you? No. What was that the super super team or something that was called? Or? Uh, super uh, junior super sport. That was last year. Junior super sport. Ah, so yes. in, in COVID, we had rode a Moto three, and mm-hmm. uh, it was only me and my dad. We just went over in the van, caravan, no idea what they expect, and it, it took us by surprise, yeah. big time. Really? Simply because you're going over, and every team had like two or three bikes for each rider. They had like two or three mechanics, a couple of technicians, and you're sort of going like. We're just rocking up on a transit van in the caravan like Chippos. Brilliant. You know, <laughs> and it, it was a rude awakening because, like, we had no idea how to set a bike up. Mm-hmm. I can come in and my dad and say, like, the front's doing this, the rear's doing that, and you would change it, but it would never really get any better. Mm-hmm. You just made a change. And it wasn't up until round three at Silverstone. At that point, we were struggling. But I thought it was just, I, I just thought I wasn't good enough. But we didn't know how far away we were set up. Like, I mean, a Moto 3. You, it shouldn't be when you hit the throttle. It should be spinning up. Jesus. That's how bad it was. I was so out of place. <laughs> and we started working with Simon King, who now works for Michael Dunlop. Yeah. And he had looked at our data. Because you had, like, um, I say data. We had, like, a wee HM dice on. So he looked at, like, the the engine maps, the engine brake, and things they got there. And adjusted a few things to suit. But he started to set the bike up suspension-wise. And at that third round of Silverstone, I was, like, 17th. The twentieth, roughly, mm-hmm. give or take a couple of people crashes. I might have got into the points or whatever. You know, my result looked better than what I was actually doing. Round four with Donington, 
And he set the bike up, and the thing was dead any different. Right away, straight into the top ten. And I wasn't riding any differently. Yeah. It was just the bike was right. It was more plotted. Yeah, and I just knew... It, sometimes, like, you just leave pit lane, go into turn one, and you're going, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. It's, this is just a new motorbike. And that's how I felt right away. And I had a real, real good round. And then went into the final round. Brands Hatch, never been. Knew nothing about it. Just knew the layout. Mm-hmm. And that's when everything clicked. Yeah. I ended up, my best ever result at BSB at the time, finished seventh. My lap times in, the f- what race was it? I think it might have been the first, yeah, was the first one? I'm, I'm not sure, but my lap times were like, my, my average race times like sort of top five. Mm-hmm. And I remember going like, this is, this is more like it. This is what I know I can do. And it was just a shame that once everything clicked into place, it was the last run of the year. Going, oh, it was too late. So you've got to wait all the next year. But we had the same intentions next year, but sort of a, a nice understanding of what we can do and what, how well we can run. Yeah. And we went to the BSB test in 21 at Snetterton, again during COVID, and my lowest position was eighth. But I was run, like during the sessions, I was top five every time. Mm-hmm. You know, P2, P3. Might have hit P1 the whole time, but it was P2, P3, P4, Jesus. back to third. And we were like, this is this is good. Yeah. And everything felt really good. Went to the Oldham Park, first round, top ten. Happy days were flying here. Big off in race two. And then went to Knock Hill, and Knock Hill was a disaster, complete oh. disaster. Because because Knock Hill, there's no normal part of it. There's nothing flat out. Everything's up or down. It's off camber. It's positive camber. It's uphill. It's downhill. Yeah. If you have an issue with the bike, it's ten times worse there. <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't ride the thing. Things all over the place. And that continued on and on. And the bike just got worse and worse and worse. And at this point, again, it's just me and my dad again. Was it because you were pushing harder, or you were seeing them results and no, no, it was trying just, a wee bit harder. No, it was. Ran as hard as I normally go, but the bike was just a joke. And then the engine blew up, so we had to put a spur engine in, which was only 40 brake. Mm-hmm. And at that time, we thought that's, that's a normal engine, it's competitive. Right. And the things got that bad. I remember after Schneiderton, my front tire was worn more than my rear. The weirdest thing I'd ever right. saw in my life. I remember looking at the front tire going, that thing was an absolute you mess. You reverse. And I, 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 I must have been. That's how bad the thing was, I may as well. <laughs> And I remember getting in from the race and looking at the front tire, and the thing, the tire was chewing up, right? Which you don't get ever. And the rear tire was as smooth as could be. I remember going, "What the hell?" And my dad, I took the bike, the John Creswell, Creswell racing, because mm-hmm. we were going to do a couple of wild cards with them for the last couple of rounds of the season. Again, like because it was a proper team, proper setup. You know, you had a rider coach, you had the mechanics, you had someone helping you set the bike up, you had everything that we needed, and yeah. we didn't have any of it. You know, again, just me and my dad in a transit van. Yeah with a ton of caravan and so we had decided to give so they says look one of our riders has blew his bike up um but don't know whether you can ride one of our bikes or not it was a whole bit of a rigmarole but they were like look either way you'll be with us somewhere or another mm-hmm. so they took our bike looked at it dynoed it and whenever my dad met john at the next round obviously i spoke to him with when I the bike um, my dad said that John's exact words were, what the fuck are you doing here? Really? The bike was terrible. It was like, it's four or five horsepower down. On a horsepower, like, it's only 40. So you're talking like 10% yeah. compared to what a thing should be. It's a cheeky bollocks too, saying that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's your wee pride and joy. I had to smack him. <laughs> at, least he, here, here, at least he was honest about it. Oh, well, I, mean, yeah. I mean, the thing looked pretty, but it certainly didn't go well. <laughs> and the whole setup, everything was wrong. And then... Um, Jason McCauley from, from over here oh, yeah. he um, he worked for them so he f- from me being home he was like well, I'll look after you he set the bike up and stuff at the final round and the thing felt fantastic you know out of a 20 lap race at Donington I went faster every single yeah. lap and by the very end of the race it was maybe like a second and a half off the leaders in a pish and wet race yeah. so in, in conditions like that like torrential rain they only be a second off in the wet it's never far you'll know yourself like yeah. Gaining time in the wet's much easier than the dry. Yeah. So we had ended the season, brutal season. At that point, we were ready to quit, completely <laughs> ready to quit. But we had ended the season with a wee bit of a high going, well, do you know what? It's not me. It's not just the bike. It's the whole thing we're doing. And it was all totally wrong. Yeah. But no one that I was able to have those sort of lap times in the final race of the year, simply because it was just set up there or thereabouts. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't crazy changes. But it was just so much better. It gave me a wee bit of hope that, okay, I haven't become a bad rider overnight. Mm-hmm. But it sort of ended my days on a Moto 3 because I was like, no, 
those things are not for me anyways. They never were, and I never felt I wrote it that well. Yeah. Even though I had good results over at home, I didn't embarrass myself for British Championship, you know, around top 10, things I got there. But I just knew my, my style in the bike isn't a Moto3 style. Right. It's just not what it is, and, and it needed a change. Mm-hmm. And at that point, we went into the winter going, I'm not doing Moto3. And my dad was like, well, we can do this and do that. And I'm going, I am not doing Moto3. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, what do we do? Do we go Junior Super Sport? Do we go to the Ducati Cup, which I had at the time? Yeah. And at that point, even though that we glimmer of hope in the last round, my confidence was that low, I was ready to stop. Because I didn't want to put my family through the stress, the time, the money, the whole effort for me to be down low mentally, simply because of a, of a poor year. I, I, I didn't want to put them through it. Yeah, so when, you're near, you're when, near when, right back to the motocross. Sort yeah, of thing. Whenever, whenever my own head wasn't right, mm-hmm. I didn't want to put them through it. And at that point, I was like, sure, I'll take a year out. Bailey was going on to the circuit. So I'll look after him. That, that was sort of the rough, I- yeah. rough idea of it. And it, well, I didn't get back on a bike at that point until May. So yeah. I'd been off since September. I never got back on a, back on a bike until May. So I'd, I'd been off quite a long time before yeah. I actually got back and That's did it right. again. You, know? yeah. you, you were gone for a brave way. Well, yeah, I was like, going for a brave I remember, way. I remember your wee brother starting then. Yeah. And um, you alongside him. And yeah. he was like, I kept thinking to myself, is he injured or is he, you know, I, I, I didn't know. I, yeah. I never asked anyone to prefer. Yeah, like, we, we had, Bailey came on the circuit scene and I was like, right, well, I'll help him out. Not that I was, not that I'm anything special, but I know enough on the wee bikes how to coach him and guide him oh, in particular right. ways. Yeah. So I was trying to look after him and that was all going well at the time, but I started to miss it. Mm-hmm. Going to racing with him and remembering how much I enjoyed it. I remember what I was missing out on. was like, I'm, I'm ready for this. Mm-hmm. And Keith Bruce and Trevor Armstrong had said to me, like, after that final Donington round, look, we'll sponsor you next year. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting in the, in the van one day, like, maybe like January, we pep back day, Bailey was out. And I remember, like, Brucey came to the door and was like, look, we'll help you out. It's not too late yet. We will still help you out. And if you want to come back, racing, we will still help you. Uh, people sort of thought I quit. I didn't quit. Yeah. But I just knew I needed a wee bit of time to get my head right and then sort of come may time be like eight, late april i remember saying with that right i'm ready mm-hmm. but i know what i want and i don't want a moto three right anything but a moto three and i was like well they would talk to brucey and trevor and see it if they're still interested and i was like look it's worth a shot mm-hmm. and both of them stuck to their word 250 um, honda i wish <laughs> i wish bruce has a 250 honda. he does hasn't he and lovely rothman's colors you want yeah. to say, oh, it's Ho- it's hopefully stunning. I'll be out on that in the Classic Festival. Really? And that will be my all-time dream come true. I will be sure to be up on the in the oh, tower slagging you off. Oh, pl- please do. <laughs> <laughs> Hand over the clutch and stuff, waiting for it to see something. What's oh. this boy at? <laughs> oh, I'll just ride around, just enjoy it. But that's, that's, hopefully I'll be on it right. um, for them. But they had said, look, we're sticking to our word. We'll get you a bike. What do you want? And I was like, look, I'll go back to the Junior Super Sports style bikes. It's something to know. And we're thinking, right, Yamaha. Simply because we knew how good the Yamaha was in 2019, chassis-wise. And these new ones, like the the, the newer model, the made, had a, a far better engine. Mm-hmm. A, a, an engine that matched the 400, so I was like, that's what I need. And Bruce was like, well, look, go go shopping. Go find something. Send me all through. He says, send me through everything. Anything you find at all, just send me it. And I sent them this Yamaha. He was like, right, is that the one for you? I was like, yep. Yeah. He's like, right, we'll make a phone call. And within two weeks of sending them with the... This is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. We had a bike and we were going to Mandela Park on a, no on a Friday way. afternoon. Yeah, It's not bad going. That's sick. And that was it. Just starting to live the dream all over again. Yeah. Right? And it wasn't until I rode that bike I realised that I just hated Moto 3s. Right. But it, it was just, the, the, at the end of 2019, it was the right direction to go. Yeah. But I didn't realise how much... This was stock then. Yeah. yeah. But I didn't realise how much I'd hated them until I hopped back on a, on a bigger bike. Not that a 300 is a big bike, but a bigger chassis, I mean. Mm-hmm. And like my first race on it, Mandela Park, they have three races in a weekend. I got three podiums right away. And I wasn't far from the front on the bike. We had, we had nothing done to it. Mm-hmm. We literally got it from England on like a Thursday night. And then we're at Mandela on the Friday. That's so sick. with no, no changes, no wow. nothing. Set the foot peg, set the handlebar, set your levers and away you go. Yeah. And I knew right away, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> and then it wasn't until... The July round, uh, the Neil and Donny Robinson round, mm-hmm. I got my first win on it. No, no. It was actually, no, it was before that, Melania. We went to Mandela Park and I won two races on the Sunday. And I remember winning those two races and going, 
this is it. I'm ready now. I'm yeah. ready to win races. At that point, like, I was running at the front, but I knew in my own head, like, I can win races, but I can't dominate them. Yeah. You know, I was in my head, I'm saying I'm sitting second or third in the leader reserve. I'm sort of going, I, I could. I could win it, but I'm just, I need that wee bit more. And then when I won those two races on the Sunday, I can remember going, I'm ready to win, mm-hmm. but I'm ready to really win. Right. And I think from Mandelo and including the Ulster Super Bike Championship, I had won like eight out of ten races. The, ne- the next eight out of ten, something like that, because I just knew when it clicked, mm-hmm. it all clicked. It all, yeah. And then by the end of the season, I won the Irish Championship after missing the first couple of rounds. Mm-hmm. I was at, at one point like I had won five out of six races in down south and in the Ulster Super Bike Championship, and I remember going like we're all singing all dancing here lap times are good you know i was on lap record pace at mandela park my lap times around bishop's court were pretty good i'd only had one run around kirkleson mm-hmm. and it was in the west so you couldn't really gauge a lap time off it but i remember at the end of the season going like how well we turned that around yeah you know from the last year and everything was back the way it was yeah from Lo- near, from near hanging the leathers up all yeah. together yeah to loving racing riding well feeling good and everything winning championships winning championships and it was just like right those years in Moto3, write them off. Forget about them. Mm-hmm. The bike just wasn't for me. Didn't have the setup. Didn't have what we needed. And that's why it wasn't great. Not for any other reason. You know, so whenever we got something that worked, and a wee team environment that worked, it was like just boom, boom, boom. It was all working. Brilliant. And that's what it takes, doesn't mm-hmm. it? It's, everything has to in, in line yeah. itself. Every, and everything has to fall in the place. If something doesn't fall in the place, then nothing's going to work. It all falls. Everything has to work. Yeah. And we've spent too much time in the gutters that we know probably in the last year and a half or so what we need to do to make it right and that's think i think that's why in the last two years i've been able to go well yeah because i know from a writer i need a b and c and i'm not i'm not a demand and as in i must have this and i must have that but in my head or if i'm talking about i'm going look i need this from the bike or we definitely need to get this get this sort or get that so i know my part from writer's point of view dad's going well i know what i need for you for you yeah. and then that just goes hand in hand yeah you know it, it's like you know it's like a ham sandwich with cheese you know it just it just, <laughs> just works it just works you know <laughs> as long as not inside out ham sandwich as long as not inside out i'll be all right <laughs> <laughs> well, sick. so you race the the 600 for two years then 300 or the 300 yeah. sorry 300 so, for so two I, years. I'd, I'd raced it at home in about yeah. a three-quarter season didn't it food season mm-hmm. and then we decided right i'm ready for british championship again yeah Go back into the junior super sport class and we trevor because he had owned half the yamaha he wanted to see the yamaha out. yeah and i knew that yamaha wouldn't be competitive not mm-hmm. that it wouldn't not that it wouldn't be but it lacked that wee bit of speed we needed it lacked that two horsepower we needed yeah and again we didn't have for, for going back to british challenge didn't have the infrastructure didn't have the technicians mm-hmm. didn't have anything like that and i remember sitting around brucey's table me down with a slings that just to get the shoulder <laughs> going so what what would you do and i remember saying to my dad and brucey going my in an ideal world affinity leon ron haslam's team yeah and i was going well why not just make the call and see what we can do and i was like right okay i didn't expect anything to come off it so i don't know who got in contact with who but because the mcmanuses were in it obviously it's someone from home you can yeah. sort of you can get that conversation out there yeah, yeah. and it sort of just it sort of fell into place and we had had a chance to have her have it have the ride so we had sort of got through the package sent through look this is what we can do this is all the cost this is a b and c and next thing you know my dad got a phone call from leon haslam <laughs> my dad answered the phone just a random phone call it's leon haslam Jeez. and then that was sort of how it all came about next thing you know i'm on a flight to Birmingham to go sign a contract so you, you were you were sitting in the kitchen we read that and he's on the phone and he goes it's leon haslam i wish it did what, what you? <laughs> I, I remember like coming home i don't know I, about you but i'd have been out the back door like I, yeah. no <laughs> I, I, th- I remember my dad telling me i don't know whether i was in the gym or he's working late or something but i remember him telling me yeah i was talking to leon haslam today and i'm like what <laughs> what are you on about <laughs> oh yeah he rung me i'm like what are you talking about but i don't know like i can't even remember the conversation they had but it was a good enough conversation that it was like, right, we've got to make this work. Yeah. And then, again, I, I sort of didn't believe it all this was happening. I'm going like, this is the ideal setup to be in. You've Ron and Leon Haslam, you know, both Grand Prix racers, you mm-hmm. know, all this sort of, like, it's just a bit mental. 
And up until I got handed the team shirt from Leon himself, I didn't believe it was you all him. Yeah. I landed in uh, Birmingham Airport, going to the NEC, met Leon, shook his hand, nice to meet you, this, that, and the other, hands me a team shirt, but there was no pen to paper. So a wee bit in the back of my head was going, it could all still fall through. You're just there to next thing, for next, next, Yeah, that's what I, yeah, that's what I thought. You know, that, that's going to be what it was going to be. Yeah. Next thing it was, I got a text from the team manager. No idea. It was some random number. Ross, you need you to come to the Kawasaki stage. You have an interview at this time for the contract. And I go, oh, it is really happening. <laughs> Next thing I was right, pen the paper. But because I was 17, yeah. obviously my dad had to do the, the paper signing work. Like counter signing, yeah. Yeah, because he's obviously an adult and I wasn't. So I couldn't actually sign my own thing. <laughs> but next thing it was the interview, you had just signed this, that, and the other. And I was like, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. And, you know, I, I remember that at the... Um, you were up on the stage. Yeah. It was a real professional setup. Yeah, like, and it, I remember it, it, seeing it, it yeah. and I was like, that's, that's Rossi. Yeah. What's he doing up there? Yeah, it, it was really, really weird because, like, obviously, like anything I've ever been like that, any of those sort of shows, whatever, before, you see all like the Honda hospitality, Kawasaki hospitality, BMW, and you, you yeah. maybe like peek over the fence and you, you see all these top riders, like, looking world, through the tent world, windows. Yeah, all, all these like world champions or MotoGP riders sitting there going, like, that's really cool. Yeah. And yeah. then next, next thing you know, you. I, I'm walking up to the Kawasaki Hospitality going like, oh, I'm meant to be a writer here, I'm a writer, I'm a writer. <laughs> and they're going like, welcome Rossi, good to have you here, and I'm going, how do you know who I am? Oh, you know, you're, and you're standing there like, I'm standing on the stage, I'm, I'm looking at people looking at me, and I'm going, this just isn't Surreal. right. I'm standing here like the Kawasaki top on doing this interview, and it's cameras, and I had never done anything like that. Yeah. You know, I was just like... This is new. <laughs> you know, but no, I, Pen- I, 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 enjoyed, I enjoyed that, we experienced of it, and then... Not long after, we were flying off to Spain for our first ever test, you know, and it, it, the Spain test, it was, it was good, but it was also tragic at the same time, you know, I had two dislocated shoulders, one one happened in a swimming pool, the next one happened lying in bed, it was the craziest thing ever. I don't want to know how you don't no, bed. No, like. no, <laughs> you, you can't explain that one, what happened, dislocated the shoulder, when, in bed, what time, uh, 2 a.m. What? <laughs> They go, what were you up to? And I go, it's not what you think. <laughs> I promise it's not. I turned over in the sling and I popped out of the sling, oh, okay? No. Don't get me wrong. Some people still don't believe me for it. They uh-huh. think I was up to no good, but... <laughs> oh, I was, it was horrible, the testing, because like, I was going down straight because so, I destroyed the shoulder twice in the, like three days. from The elbow was up here and it was horrible, but that was the start of me riding for the Haslam family in British Championship last season. What, did the pressure ever get to you or... You know, within the team, because obviously it's sort of your real first. Yeah. Go first with the team. Team. Yeah. yeah. Never. Ever. No. And I, I don't really get a lot of pressure. The only thing I ever get, you could say, relates to it's nerves. Yeah. But nerves are normal for me. I know how to work them. I've never had any sort of essence of oh, I need to do this or I need to try and do this. Never had any of that. You need to push harder. No. Or even with your teammate, oh, I have Nothing. to beat him. No, I never. I never believe in that. People always say, "Oh, first rule in racing: beat your teammate." Never. Ah, yeah. The only th- only person I think of on the bike is me. Yeah. I don't care if my teammates, I don't care if there's four of us on the team, I don't care if they're top three mm-hmm. and I'm down here. As long as I know the direction I'm going, that's, that's good enough for me. Um, that's, a, that's a good mindset. You know, but we, we were, uh, some writers didn't feel a bit of pressure, not from anyone in particular, just themselves putting it on. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, as the season went, I became really close to Ron. Don't get me wrong, I was friendly with Leon and stuff, but me and Ron were real, real good. Right. You know, it wasn't like I came in from a session, work with him on the bike, and then that was it. You know, I was able to just go and sit and lay on. I wouldn't even call it a motorhome, call it a house on wheels. I was able to go and sit in there and sit with Ron for a couple of hours watching the Northwest from 1989, talking about JPS Nortons and stuff. You know, oh, no yeah, one else gets yeah, that. Yeah. You know, I, I can sit there and talk to him about that kind of stuff, and then next thing it's like, here, Ross, I need you down at the owner. I'm like, oh, yeah, the reason I came to see you, I need to set this bike up. Oh. You know, that, that, was, that was like how me and him worked. Yeah. And you know, the oldest nineteen-year-old I've ever met talking about <laughs> Nortons and flipping. <laughs> hey, if you think that's bad enough, I can tell you some random facts. You're you're like me. You're you were born in the wrong. Oh era. yeah, hundred percent. I I know the most random things about racing. Yeah. Ever. Like I I be sitting in a Bruce or something, and he be talking about this, and I know like say he's talking about a rider on a particular bike in a year, and I go, no, that's not right. He's like, it is. Shrive was there, and I go, no. Say we're talking because Joey on I don't know one two five and go. At their photo, what's 98 TT? Well, no, it's Northwest 99. I'm going, no, it's not. <laughs> He's like, it is. I was bloody here. And I'm going, Brucey, I'm telling you, I know it. Yeah. I know it's not. Yeah. And you know, like, 
I remember like even even like stupid things like I mean Brucey might have been there but he wasn't sober <laughs> no, <that's laughs> no if, if there's pints of talent still be on them you know but uh, I don't know I, I just my, my whole thing in racing is is it is the old times yeah you know and I, I'm so weird I don't know if I'm autistic or something but I mean seeing <laughs> see, see, see it comes to the road racing or anything like that I get, you could give me a photo from 1996 alright so, some random road race whatever down south and I could probably tell you every rider in the photo seriously yeah but that's just because I'm just so obsessed with it there's you definitely know, a tism there. Like, oh, hold, yeah, hold, hold, no, no, doubt about, no doubt about it. Like, you know, I, I was I was sitting in work the other day, and a mate of mine does motocross, and we always talk about roads and circuits and things like that there. Mm-hmm. And I remember, like, he was t- he, no, it wasn't the other day. It was a couple of weeks ago, and we we're talking about like, the TT from the eighties. And I remember going, "Here, I've got a question for you. Here's here's one for you." Mm-hmm. And I remember going, "What have you got for me?" And he goes, "Who won the 1985 Junior TT?" And I remember going, "Johnny Ray." And he goes, no, it wasn't. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it was. And I, 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 and I, I haven't even fact-checked it, but I'm nearly sure of it. Actually, I'm going to do it now. I just, it just, right. just to double-check. Because <laughs> I remember saying it to him, and I remember thinking, have I got that wrong? But yeah. I was 99% sure in my head that that's what year it was. I hope you're right, because this so is going to be embarrassing, mate. If I get, if I get this wrong, <laughs> this, this, cut is, it out. this is not getting cut out, no. Definitely. Or was it Joey? Oh, I might be wrong. Oh, I, I, I can't even get the result up because my 4G won't work. How long? What is it? 1985. 1985. Oh, no, 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 Johnny was 89. Junior. No, yeah, you can't go back anywhere. Johnny was 89. <laughs> Junior. I, get, I wish I could get up. TT winner. It's only Joey now, isn't it? Mm. I think Johnny Ray was 89. Stephen Cole. Steve Cole. I think it's 89. Look up 89. Oh, yeah, fuck you. If it's 89. Oh, it was Joey. Stephen Cole's second. I got my second guess right. Right, 89. 89. I'm, right. I th- uh, 1989. I'm nearly sure it was Johnny Ray. Sammy Dobson. <laughs> <laughs> the 13 year old. Johnny Ray. See? Yeah. See? It was. And I knew I had it under somewhere, but that's like my whole nation motorbikes. It is, is 70s, 80s, 90s. Just yeah. roads. You know, that's just my thing. Now, that's, that's just where I'm. Glued into so like being able to like to work uh, after I bash myself there for two minutes. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have to go back to the conversation now. You know, but like be, being able to like the, have those sort of chats and that kind of thing with Ron Haslam, you're sort of going this guy wrote Grand Prix and mm-hmm. things like that. You know, that uh, TT winner himself, eighty two. I, I don't know that one. Formula One on the four hundred. <laughs> I can tell you that for a hundred percent fact. Um, you know, that that's what made me really enjoy BSV because I can go completely relaxed, yeah. knowing that I've got someone there who's enough knowledge. Helps set a bike up that knows everything. Started to know me as a rider, as in my style, how how I corner, how I break, how I build up the lap time, these sort of things. And he he knew me inside out, like, mm-hmm. and that's what really brought me on. And like, don't get me wrong, we had big downfalls during the year. You know, we had our motorhome stolen. You know, you had your motor your motorhome, or it was Brucey's. Well, it was we called it ours, but I mean, it was Brucey's yeah, motorhome. Really, we flew into Birmingham Airport. That sounds like an insurance job to me. Time to get a bit of coin. Um, Third party car <laughs> theft. We um, flew into Birmingham, pick up the motorhome, let's go to Snedderton, got to where it was parked, it was gone. Jeez. Stolen. Christ. And I can remember going like, are we going to race this weekend? And Bruce was like, oh no, we're, we're still going to race, we're still going to race. And I was going, after this was stolen? I'm like, yeah, we're, we're here now. And from that point on, like, I mean, my dad had had an inventory of tools built up since I was a kid, only starting out. Up until this point, next thing it was all gone. Jeez. Didn't even have as much as a pit board. And I can remember sticking a thing on Facebook about it. Not like, oh, feel sorry for me. It was just like in the off chance that someone in England might have known something about mm-hmm. it. And I mean, my phone never stopped. People ringing me, texting me. I'll get yes, I'll give you that. Oh, and, really? You know, and we got, you know, we got by for the rest of the season. But, Jeez. you know, we had big setbacks like that there. Did he ever find the motorhome? No. No way. Stole, never came back. Brucey's like, let's go to Arnold Clark and buy a brand new one. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> oh, no, but that was, I think that was our biggest downfall you know, throughout the year, but I mean, with so much downfalls. and mm-hmm. I mean, like my first ever time on the bike, I mean, we, I remember we arrived to Silverstone first round and my class had got a test on the Thursday evening. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, Thursday morning, whatever it was. And my the, the 400 had just been built. I think it had just been finished being built that day, like in the morning time. First ever time on it, wet conditions, like just go out, feel the thing, just enjoy it, go, go and do what you want to do. And second ever lap, 
I just lent them their corner. Next thing, the back end spun around, boom, straight over the top. Oh. Off the throttle, high center, and we're going, how'd that happen? But I was just tumbling, I dislocated this shoulder, and it popped back in. No, no, sorry, it's, it's the left one. Dislocated it, popped back in at the same time. Fractured my arm, but didn't realize. Ooh. Raced on with a fractured arm all weekend. You know, we, we disasters like that there. But that was because of, of something to do with the shock. I can't remind exactly. But because it was new bike built and things like that there, there was just something didn't get tweaked or set right or mm -hmm. whatever it was. It was a wee silly thing. It wasn't anything bad or nothing. It wasn't if the team made a mistake or nothing. Yeah. But it was just like first ever session of the thing. Lap two, broken arm, just get a shoulder. Yes. Brilliant, happy days. And we didn't know any wiser. Mm -hmm. When I went to the medical at the track, he's going, oh, you've definitely dislocated it, but it's popped back in. So loaded me up with the painkillers <laughs> and I thought I'd be all right. But it was the fracture in the arm really killed me. Yeah. And by the time I went home, I'd booked him a physio. Just I was like, look, this arm still caused me a lot of havoc. Can you just have a, a look over it? See your thing and he goes, ah, you've, there's a weak fracture in it. But because of the way it was, there's nothing you could do about it. You couldn't put yeah. it in a cast or nothing. So I just had to just sort of just let be, it go. Be careful with it. Yeah, and, and it still gives me jip now. Like, I mean, if I like, even play like, a game of pool where you stretch the arm out, oh, yeah. I, I'll be sitting there playing a game of pool next to me, like, just shooting pain goes through. You know, so it's, it, <laughs> you know, the, the effects have still lasted on me. Yeah. But I mean, like, other than a few setbacks, last year I had a, had a great year. Yeah. In, in my own terms, and more how I developed my own riding and my ability to understand a motorbike mm -hmm. you know and that was what really kept me going as in you know i can come in and say that bike's so much better it's you know it's doing this it's doing that but i can it got to the point where i started to know the bike that, that well i could come in and say that needs to turn a preload in the front mm -hmm. and my dad's going how do you know and i go i've had the conversations i know what they expect from the bike and i know it needs one turn he's going right okay next thing maybe ron comes into the awning so how's this Give me a turn of preload on the front, okay. Is this based on like the conversation we had before and this is what you're feeling? Yeah, exactly. So I started to understand a lot more how to develop a bike and understood it, develop my riding as well. And I you know, have plenty of highlights from last year, you know. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of top six finishes, I had front row starts, you know, at World Superbike, I'd broke the lap record, I'd pole, you know, the day at a World Superbike event was pretty cool. Yeah. But you know, and I had a few top tens as well as that, you know, so I certainly didn't embarrass myself. I had a relaxable, a relaxable uh, an enjoyable, relaxed year, British Championship. It wasn't as high stress for me. I was able to just sort of let everyone crack on, and I suited myself. Not in a, oh, I'm part of a team now, usual work away. It wasn't like that. It was sort of my dad like sending me away. Oh. As in, look, I have no need for you to be here. I'm just tinkering with the bag, just doing A, B, and C. Go chill out, go see your mates. Really? You just go do what you want. Oh. And I was able to just chill out all weekend, and obviously, when it came to crunch time, it was like, right, game face one, let's uh, go and sure, do it. Sure. But, Your job. You know, and you know we, we tried to get back into it this year just didn't have the money for it at all mm -hmm. but you know last year really enjoyed it i would go back with the team in a heartbeat you know i'm still in contact with the, the haslam's as well you know so it's not as if like i've just done one year and that's me going you know i'm still mm -hmm. in contact with like the and stuff so it's a yeah. nice thing to continue on that's, so you had the, your world super big wild card well i was so we our, our junior super sport championship did the world shooter bike round so, yes. we, so it was the same but we we had done because yeah, they miss they miss another round somewhere don't they the junior super sport yeah yeah we don't do it they, they do eight out of 12 rounds yeah that's right, I, right. I think that's the same in most classes bar maybe like super sport or something mm -hmm. and maybe super stock maybe 10 or something the only thing that does the full championship is actually just the super bikes yeah. stock miss one don't they? Do they, well, yeah, yeah, yeah they do. but again we, we had um we had MotoGP, like we had done the British Grand Prix and the Moto3 and stuff, it was cool as well. Jeez. But the World Superbike one was cool because you did have wild cards coming in. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, like, it was just, it was still, a, in my own head, still a BSB event. Mm -hmm. The only difference being, you had Top Rack and Johnny Ray walking past you. <laughs> everything felt the same, everything looked the same, you know, and we were in the same paddock as them. We were in MotoGP, we, we were secluded, so you knew you were at MotoGP at World Superbike. I was just walking in the paddock and, you know, there goes Bull again. There goes him, there goes him, and you're just like nodding the head and just walking along as if they're nobody else. As if they're, yeah. Yeah, you know, the, the only big difference I sort of noticed was just the crowds. You know, you just go down cleaner curves, and like, because you're like looking ahead, you can see all the crowds up on the big wall, or the wall on the big grass bank, and everyone, there's a lot of people here, but you know, <laughs> it, 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 it was good, you know. But I never treated any differently, where I think some people did, because of just what kind of event we were at. Yeah. And maybe I got them, I don't know, but for me, it was just another race, you know. Did you tell anyone you were here? 
<laughs> no, I think we're after you. I, I was, I was told there's been arrested at some point. So. Brilliant. Hopefully, don't check the phone or something. <laughs> so, what made you? You were doing. You were so successful last year. And what made the change this season to go literally go all out? <laughs> and what? from what 40, 40 brake horsepower? Uh, fifty. Fifty. Fifty brake uh, horsepower to. 50. 200. 220, <laughs> something like that. 200 on the dot. 200. That's, that's what the Susie is, yeah. Oh, um, so, at the end of the season, so I had three sponsors. So I had Brucey, Trevor Armstrong, and the Essence Vault. They were the one who got me into the team. Mm-hmm. So they're the one who paid the fee, got me in. Unfortunately, Trevor died. Yeah. And the Essence Vault guy was a very nice fella. Only had the one time, but he was, he's not a motorbike person. Mm-hmm. But he was going, like, I'll do it for the year. But he wasn't going to be like, I'll oh, continue on, make something out of it. He's just helped me out for the one year. And like, I can't complain about that. Mm-hmm. I can't, you know, I'll take anything and get sponsorship wise. Oh, yeah. So we, we already knew from the moment he had stepped on that it's only a one year thing. That's fine. And then when Trevor died, in terms of sponsorship, Brucey was left on his own. Right. So, and at this point, we had the Yamaha, we done BSB. You know, you, know, you can't ask much more for any, any, anybody. You know, never mind. Oh, yeah, we're going to try and do this, try and do that. And we hemmed and had about the BSB thing, going back with the Affinity team and in this new 400 class, but it just never materialised. You know, Leon was on the phone to me a few times, like, here's the date the team needs to be released by. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you know, all the writers and stuff, keep me posted if you can, if you can't. And I remember having the, having the ring, I'm just saying, look, sorry, but we're Nothing, right. nothing you can do. And, and the, the disappointing thing was that the team had asked for me back. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't just like, oh, you're coming back, okay. You know, Leon and Ron were like, no, we want you back. They we wanted want, you we back. Want, we want yeah. you here. We're, there's probably other writers in the team that sort of go, um, we're going to take it or leave it. Aye. Where I was just like, they're asking, and both of them asked me in person on, on over the phone, like, we want you here, and I'm going, I wish I would I would give anything, but it never it never worked out. And I, I remember, like, sort of going, what, what do you do now? You know, junior ship sports the cheapest class, so we can't get back across the water. Okay, we're going back home. What are we doing at home? You know, the R3 was there, and that was an option, and it was quite a big option for, for a while. And I remember like, being like, look, when this season starts, I'm going to be 19. Yeah. I don't want to be on these wee bikes forever. And it needed a lot of work done too, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, it needed need re- need refresh, rebuilt, that kind of thing. And I remember just being like, not, not like, oh, I need to move on now, but it was just mm-hmm. like, but I do need to move on. I need to have that, that step. Yeah. And obviously everyone's like, go to us. Oh, sure, get a 600 or get a twin and work your way up. And... You know, That's checkbook racing, that like. Complete checkbook. You know, I mean, a, a super twin now, a good one probably costs more than a super bike. A super, yeah. You know, yeah. and then a six hundred is just as dear to buy as a super bike, but you're more having expensive the, to run. Yeah, you know, you've got engine refreshes and this and that, and I remember thinking like, the only viable option really is to go big bike. Mm-hmm. And I remember him and had about and had a good thought, thinking, well, do you know what, you know, like my natural style of a motorbike might suit it mm-hmm. i'm i'm not built for riding the life out of a bike like you would a 600 mm-hmm. or like a super twin I, I like using the power of a motorbike yeah and on the way bikes you don't have the power to use mm-hmm. so you've got to adapt i had to adapt my style to learn how to ride the life out of these things where the big bike you twist it and the party you know the bike has enough power on its own to do its own thing yeah and for a few weeks it was sort of like you really big bike and i was like yeah i know i want to do it and my, my dad didn't really fancy it he's like i've read these things you, you don't know what you're in for yeah but we got a deal over our line for uh the suzuki and my dad had a wee soft spot for suzuki's because the first ever big bike hero was one yeah so he knew that like okay as a chassis fantastic as an engine they're an animal yeah but he read them way over 20 years ago but he's did he, going did he ride for raymond lilly i have no suzuki. idea I don't know. I think he had bought his Suzuki. I don't think he rode it for anybody. Right. Yeah. I, I wouldn't. I've never even heard of him, to be honest. No. <laughs> um, so he knew, like, the chassis are good, and if the chassis are still the same way they are now, obviously, as times move on, bikes become a bit more readable, and you like, try to use your friendlies, right? That's what we'll go for, and that's what we got. Yeah. And I'm, I remember, like, picking the bike up at Lance's and just looking at it and starting it up, and I remember just sitting there, like, revving it, going, rawr, 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 rawr. throttle control. <laughs> <laughs> I remember just going, like, Oh, they're big tires. That's, that's a live motorbike. This is like this is mine now. Oh, Jesus! But you know, we went to Spain, and I'd worked it out like in my head what they expect. Mm-hmm. So it never took me by surprise. 
I mean, no. my, my first ever session coming in, like, uh, the speedo was on the bike, and I was working, I don't know why the speedo was on, but I can remember my third ever lap, doing 175 down the back straight, and going like, so that's 175 miles now. <laughs> but, uh, but people are going like, oh, just you with this, you're going like, your eyes are going like this size, and you're going to be shitting yourself on, yeah. I remember just sitting at those speeds and going like, this is alright, this isn't bad. Jesus. And I got, you know, and it just <laughs> chipped away, and it wasn't very fast in Spain and whatnot, but like, I remember like, on day three, Send them a dad, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to get the hang of this thing. And he's like, oh, how's it feel? And I'm going, yeah, it feels good. Same this thing. I don't know how's like the speed and the power. And I'm feeling like, well, I still, I'm sort of used to it by now. Like, and he's going, what? And I'm like, I was doing 180 and I like, didn't blink twice. Which is like, that's, that's what it is. And I don't get me wrong, like, but whenever you have a bit of a moment, you, you feel every you feel every mile oh, an hour. Yeah, yeah. But whenever things are going right, and you're sitting at those speeds, it's just like, it's just another motorbike. I reckon your dad was popping dies of pounds flat out. Didn't oh, I, I, see a I, bottle I, like I, I would say he probably took a few lines of coke as well when he's had it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's well, I'll say super bike. It's a super stock, completely stock bike, and a lot of people seem to forget that. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm right. I'm not gonna write myself off or talk about anyone else, but I'm riding against some very good machinery. Oh yeah. You know, the Suzuki's good bike, completely stock. It's got an exhaust, suspension. You know, it's still got. You know, standard brake. Okay, it's got a master cylinder, but everything else is bog standard on it. So, but well, the Suzuki's good. But it's a good bike. Way. But, yeah. it, but it is it is a good bike. You know, and it's good standard bike. You know, yeah. it's not as if like you need the, like the, the chassis. Good things. The chassis was always great on them, and yeah. you know, they, they always reminded me they were like to me they're between a BMW and a Honda. Mm-hmm. Well, the BMW chassis is actually I'm pretty sure it's based around the Suzuki. Yeah, chassis. But that's what, you know, they're in between the, the power and the reliability and the handling yeah. of a Honda and the BMW. And yeah. it's, I never got the newer Suzuki. Okay? I was always on the older one, like, but they were always, we had a K6. Mm-hmm. And it was a fantastic bike. Like, yeah. I still, I think two years ago or three years ago, it was the year before I retired. And from 2008 or 2009, No, I'm getting it completely wrong. <laughs> it was twenty. I think it was twenty twelve. I rode the Suzuki, and I only beat my fastest lap round versus court the year I retired, like three years ago, on the Kawasaki. You know, and it was only one hundred and seventy brake. The Suzuki. <laughs> but that, that's just just the frame. Just shows how good they are. I mean, the, the chassis on mine's unbelievable. Like I mean, mm-hmm. I'm at the minute I'm having a lot of struggles with getting things set up and whatnot. But I mean, like, see the front end of the thing. Like I mean, yeah. you pitch it in the corner and it sticks. You can plant it on. You can plant yeah. it any way shape or form and it will just stay which suits me because i'm always very heavy on the front end but i mean i've only been on the bike 10 minutes compared to what i'm riding against and who i'm riding against and things like that but yeah. at the minute like i'm just taking each lap as it comes not expecting anything at all but i'm just enjoying it and yeah. i'm and to be fair like it's the most fun i've ever had in the motorbike yeah you, you know, look like you're enjoying yourself I am, yeah i think it's because i know the way I ride a bike, I like to use the power in the thing. And as I said already, like you can't, there's not enough power to use in the smaller bikes. Where this thing has enough power that you can use it. You know, you can control the thing in your right hand by just opening the throttle. It's not like you must be just whacking it and mm-hmm. keeping the RPM singing the whole race and things like no. that. There, you know, they're a totally different style of riding. Short shift and keep e- it, everything's too late. Keeping the front end down. Oh jeez, I've got a big issue with that. The minute Jesus <laughs> Christ, that night, <laughs> doing do my head in, but like. You know, at the minute, I'm not, I'm not doing anything special. You know, in terms of riding, but I'm doing enough that I can come in every session and go, right, need a bit of this, need a bit of that. I want to try and work with this. Want to try and work with that. And some of the things are okay. I need to change this on the bike. And other things are going. Look, I'm struggling with this, but it's down to me. Mm-hmm. I just need to change my technique or whatnot. And I'm finding that balance between some things that I can control and some things that we just need to change. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll take a while too. Oh, 100%. I mean, like, you know, room wasn't built in the day, but these big bikes, as you well know yourself, you know, you don't learn them overnight anyways, but, no. you know, any real good rider on a super bike will tell you themselves, you know, you don't, you don't learn it in two months either. It can take a couple of years to properly understand what you're doing. So that's the way I'm looking at it. I'm looking at the super bike thing, or the super stock, whatever you want to call it, like in, in the long term. Yeah. I'm not going, I must be doing these lap times, getting these results in the next two months. I'm sort of going, well, look at, Two, three, four years down the line. Yeah. Who knows what's what's going to happen? Two, three, three years was really from when I started riding superbikes. Three years is when I started yeah. stepping on the podium. Yeah. 
and my first year I was being lapped, you know, and it was demoralizing. And we were like, you know, but the people lapping me was Cameron Donald and, and flipping, yeah, you know, real top Keith, Keith, Keith Amore. And, and, and you're probably in that position going, How are these people doing this? Uh, yeah, but then, but then as the time goes along and you start to understand it, develop yourself the bag, and you're getting there. Next thing you're going, I can do it now, yeah, I'm in the ballpark, yeah, but you, it just takes that time to get up there. It's real weird, like, because you feel. My first year, I was pushing to the limit. The bike was all shapes, and I yeah. was coming in destroyed. Was, the sweat was lashing off me. And the boys, like Cameron Donald and whatnot, they were just past me, like Adrian Archibald and all. They yeah. just passed me like it was nothing. Yeah. You know. And I, yeah, and I think, to be honest, that's the position I'm in at the minute. Like, I mean, every time I'm out, I'm riding things as hard as it can go. with things fucking and waving all over the track. It's, mm -hmm. it's weighing, it's down. There's just so much going on. I have no... And every single lap I've been on the thing ever, mm -hmm. I've never had a break. Never had one moment where like, okay, chill out now. Even then the yeah. streets, like I was, I was saying to Johnny like, earlier on, like the things that far away from being set up the way I want, I'm going down the streets, having to hang off the side of it. Yeah. To steer the thing straight now. Yeah. You know. You have to pull. You have, people say, oh, you get a break down. Even at road racing. Yeah. The Northwest and stuff, they say, oh, you get a break in the university. You do no, not you, get you, a break in the universe. You're trying to keep the thing in line. Yeah. And that's me on a circuit, never mind a road race. And the things, and you're pulling yourself forward yeah. and, oh, it's... Yeah, there's so much going on, but I, I know as time goes on, I'll start to develop the technique and the style I need to make the thing go where I want and still mm -hmm. have to go down a straight, like just being able to get tucked in and relax. And being able to relax, yeah. yeah. I, I know what will come over time and that's something I can change. Okay, something can implement that, you know, on the bike setup wise, you know, at the minute, my big thing is keeping the front wheel down. It just it just keeps coming up. Yeah. And obviously, you know yourself. Like once it comes up out of a corner, hits the ground, all settles, and it's everything's just. You're losing. Oh, yeah. You know, tenths and hundreds of seconds here and there. And, and at the minute, like I mean, I'm not chasing lap time. I'm just chasing feeling and understanding. Mm -hmm. But whenever you're in racing mode and you're and someone's in front of you, a couple of tenths up the road, if you're losing those tenths because of things, will you not because you're made a mistake or something? It's demoralizing. You're going, yeah. Like, they're just creeping and creeping. And you know what you have to do, but you forget it. Yeah. When you're sitting on a donkey that's trying to kill you all the time. Like, yeah. You know? There's just <laughs> so much going on. It. Like, but like at the minute, I'm really, really enjoying it. I know that there's a lot to come, and that's not just me just saying that as in, oh, because it, it's a bit cliche, every rider who's on a new bike, oh, there's more to come, there's more to come, and sometimes it might never. Mm -hmm. Who's going to say I'll ever improve this thing now? But I know in my own head, with the way the bike's set up and the way I'm riding it, there's potential for a lot more to come. Yeah. I just need to work it out, feel the thing, and just give it time. And that's my big thing at the minute, just give it time. Don't rush into it. Because, no. I mean, these sort of bikes, that, you know, one day they're perfect, one day they're not perfect. And that could be the difference, and because they're because of what they are, mm -hmm. that could be the difference between you know being two seconds faster, or three seconds slower, which is just crazy on those sort of bikes. Where like on the wee bikes, you can make up time mm -hmm. just by your riding with these things. It's just the power and how everything works on them. So mm -hmm. you know, I I know that there's there's days ahead. I'm going to struggle, and yeah. I'm going to struggle massively. Oh, you will. And I I'm going like what sorry, is to, sorry to tell no, you, no, I, I know you're, you're fucked, mate. I, I, know, <laughs> I know there's going to be days going to come. Wow doing this yeah yeah and then there's other days you're going ah yeah. this is why i do this yeah. this is why i love it see when you get your first super bike podium oh stop it at the minute not even thinking that far no. at the, at, see to be honest at the minute i'm just worrying about from a rider's point of view i want to try and get good results in the pro races mm -hmm. you know at the minute i'm sort of hovering between sort of sixth and tenth to kirkus and there was sort of sixth and seventh and like at the minute and that is not often it was snapped out like. you, you know for the time i've had in the bike for the experience I've got on a big bike, because I, mm -hmm. I went from a 50, a 50, 50, 50 horse part of 200, you know, I've had no time like, to develop over those years in terms of like, I went super twin at 100, then I went super oh, sport at yeah. 140, I just went from zero to right up to here, yeah. pretty much, so, you know, to be running there at the minute, six, sort of six, seven in the pro race, riding with real good riders is, is a big thing for me, like, I mean, the first lap of the first race on Saturday, I completely shit myself because I went in the yeah. debtor's fifth and I held fifth the whole, <laughs> the whole first lap. And I'm sitting there like looking looking ahead of me. You had there was uh, there was Ryan Gibson, Johnny Campbell, Corey McGravy, and who's the other one? Off top of my head, I can't remember the other one. I'm looking at and going. Last year, I sat in the sidelines watching these boys fight for yeah. wins, and now I'm now I'm with you. Yeah. You know, next thing I went through debtors and. Aaron Spence dove underneath me and Dean McMaster came and I was like, okay, here, the real boys are coming behind <laughs> you know. But look, you know. Like, Come on, boys. Yeah, no, I, I'm on, not meant to be on. here. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'm just getting in your way. Go ahead. Don't worry about it. But look, at the minute, I'm just trying to toe on to them riders. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a really, really good Easter Monday. 
and I was battling with uh, it was Kyle Cross and Dean McMaster in the wet race. Yeah. And up until like two or three laps to go, because I made a couple of mistakes, I was right with them. Mm -hmm. Every lap I was right there. I was right there. I think I was about a second behind them over the line, but I could see them on the sides, and I kept. It was Dean in front of me for most of it, and I was able to catch him through deaders yeah. and get right up his tail. And then between Colonial and Fisherman's, he would got me again. But then at the end of the lap, back in the deaders, I would catch him again. But I am sort of going, right, these boys are proper pilots, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're no slouches. So for me at the minute, just being able to tag on to them for a few corners or a lap or two yeah. is more than good enough for me. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever him and um, Aaron came past me there on Saturday, I held on to them for maybe two laps before they started the edge, maybe two or three seconds, and next thing you know, they're gone. But being able to hang on for, for maybe those two laps is is more than I'm happy with. Oh, I I'm know. able to go with like them boys are proper good if pilots. You, if you learn something, if you learn two or three corners off them, that's, 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 that's enough. That's enough. That's and enough. And then the next two or three yeah. corners, and then you know, if I if I wanted to be a maniac, I could hang on to them for longer and rest throw myself to the moon and back. You yeah. know, and that's the last thing I need at the minute. You know, you know, whenever they start to pull away that bit more, and I know I'm on my own limit at the time. You know, I could physically go harder, but I'm I'm putting myself at risk. Where at that point I'm going, you you have a good race. Yeah. Let, let let me just do what I'm doing here, and you know, keep chipping away at the lap times. But look, like, to be honest, uh, the way I'm feeling at the minute, the bike, the way I felt on Saturday, you know, the bike, the bike was far away to be quite blunt about it in, in terms of setup. The fuel pump went. Which didn't help either. You know, I was like, they still give bother if you. Oh, it was a disaster. Like the, the big problem was actually on the side of the tire because on the side of the tire, on the quarter entry, bike was fine. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I started to set it up and hit the gas, it was cutting out. Right. So next thing, it cuts out, and all the power came back in. So it's like two or three times every lap. It's like riding a two-stroke. I was just gonna hang around. <laughs> this big thing stepping out, trying to spit me over the yeah. thing. And then next thing, we had a bit of error in, in the brake. So the brake was coming in the bar. Oh, no. So again, I'm going down that back street, just praying to make it to the corner. I got to that point where I was able to hold the brake at full, like, squeezing the brake as much as I could, right to the apex. Jesus I, Christ. You know, you know, I couldn't do any more. Yeah. And I did it like a 57 eight or something. I remember going like, uh, I'm not happy with that because I know that if the bike was right, I'm not saying there's crazy time left there, but there's definitely half a second yeah. alone. You know, and just those two things, never mind actually getting spring rates right and the setup, ride height, all those sort of things. Once we sort of get it right, I know that if we get those right, there's potential to be You're right a, at the point a, a, there, a, a second or two right up there. Yeah. It's just a matter of trying to find it. And then if we do find it, it's down to me to do the work. Well, like, what are they doing? High 56s or last weekend? Uh, I think for I think they were doing 55s. Is that right? I think they were, I think the one of the best laps I saw was like fifty five four. See, I told you I should know this, and I can't even bloody remember. But <laughs> I have about I have two screens and all this pair working for yeah. me, telling me what they're doing. I can't remember. I, I don't know if that was just like one lap pace or that was over the entire race. But yeah. I, I, I would have said with them two fight or with them two like the, the group of the people from you know, mm -hmm. fighting. They probably were in fifty sixes because they're slowing each other down and stuff. Oh, so yeah. to be within you know that one point eight, one point nine ballpark, sort of pushing two seconds mm -hmm. from a first time at Kirkson in the dry. I'm sort of I'm not I'm not happy with it, but I'm content sort yeah. of going like I'm not a million miles away. Yeah. If we get it right, there's time to be made. But not let's not let's not rush it. Mm -hmm. Let's just take our time. But the best thing is it. you know what you have to do. Yeah, I, to I, I I know what I've got to do from a rider's point of view. I know what yeah. I need from the bike. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of trying to make the two work. You know, there's there's days you know yourself, the bike's perfect and the rider says no. Yeah. And yeah. there was days like Saturday there where I felt pretty good in my riding. But the bike just wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. And the, the more we've analysed it and sort of looked at it, like the bike's so close to being right, but it's so far away at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some aspects, you're going, tell you what, that's not far away. That's sort of in the ballpark. And then there's other aspects, you're going, that thing is over this way. Like, yeah. It's just not playing ball at all. So, you know, if we can get it right, who knows what we can do. But look, I'm not going to count, you know, my eggs before the hatch or anything like that. And I'm not going to say, oh, I'm going to win this or I'm not going to win this championship and I'm going to do A, B and C because I don't think like that anyways but you know I'm just going to look at it take each race by race and just hope that over the season I can just develop enough that I can finish the end of the season going yeah that's alright yeah just as long as you're happy with it as long, not as long as I'm necessarily happy because at the end of the day every rider has different goals and every race if you're a racer you're going to win mm -hmm. that's it it doesn't matter who you are you're going to win that's the way it is mm -hmm. you're not going for any other reason really and 
you know, every rider has different goals. I say, you know, some people want to finish in the top six, some people want to finish top ten, some want to win every race. And you know, if you're one of those riders for toxic, you know, I want to finish top ten in a championship. Doesn't matter what championship to anyone. Mm-hmm. You know, you achieving that top ten is like you win. That's yeah. your holy girl. You've done what you want. For me, I don't think like that. No, I, I can't. For me, it's just how far I'm away from first, mm-hmm. and that's that's the way it is. So, you know, when I'm looking at race results and time sheets and whatnot from like the week going going by there, I'm looking at seventh in the pro race going. Sixth place at first, oh, yeah. you know, and, yeah. it's, and it's like, how do I get up there? Mm-hmm. You know, how how do I break into that next, that that next group of riders, who are run at the front every single week? You know, what what does it take to get there? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not looking at these boys going, I ah, usually just better than me. These are on better bags, or I'm gonna throw excuses all over the place. I'm not gonna do that. You know, I'm gonna look at it and go right. Well, you know, what's Johnny Campbell or what's Ryan Gibson doing different to me? Yeah. You know what? What on their ride and they doing? Experience that that I can do or implement. You know, that's the way I'm looking at it. So, mm-hmm. like, we've not we've plenty of rides left. At the, you know, this season. So, I know there's gonna be bad days coming. Mm-hmm. I know there's gonna be good days coming. So, <laughs> I'll just I'll just take it. I'll take it. Yeah, that's you the last thing about motorbike racing. Oh, it? I know. You know it's gonna hurt very soon. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh, but <sighs> what's long term plan then? The future. What is the future for yeah. Rossi? My dad, in terms of what he wants from me, he wants me back in BSB because he knows if I don't go BSB, I'll end up in roads. Mm-hmm. And he wants me to stay away from roads as long as I possibly can. Well, there's not that many of them. I know. And for me, I'm polar opposite. <laughs> I'm polar opposite. So yeah. then, I, I, I've said to him since I was a baby, you know, and like I said, you know, we're talking like six, seven years old when I started getting the motorbikes and racing and stuff. And like three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, roads are my thing. That's that's my thing. That's yeah. what I want to do. Yeah. And it's everything that I love about motorbikes. And I've had so many conversations with them about it. And it's always been, no, no, it ain't happening, it ain't happening. But I'm going down there, like, you know, we were funny about a conversation about it the other week. And I was like, Dad, look, whether you like it or not, I'm old enough to do them now. <laughs> and I was like, you know, and the difference is, in a couple of years time if they're still about and i'm floating my own boat you know i'm living my own life like away from home sort of thing you know there's gonna be a, gonna gonna be a day all being well that it's gonna happen whether you like it or not yeah whether you're there or whether you're not it's gonna happen jesus christ i said that oh, oh, you no. hit me a dig like you know, you know, it, it, <laughs> and, and like I, I, i've probably i've lectured him that many times about it in the past few years, I think he's not not accepting it's going to happen, but he, he's accepting that he knows how can I am. He's just rolling his eyes and sort of let you get on with it. Yeah, sort of and, thing. and he and he knows that one of these days I'm going to tell him that look, this is it's for real and it's happening. You have an entry into the northwest. And... <laughs> I've been I've been, me, I've been badgering him all year about getting the arm away. Yeah. You know, even when my dad was in here a while ago getting tattooed, and Johnny was badgering him, Hartley was badgering yeah. him. You know, let yeah. him do it, let him do it, let him do it. You yeah. know, arm away was one of my first. Um, was it? Oh. On a BMW, two hundred and she was two hundred and thirty brake. Like, Jesus, I know. For a first, first one, that's a bit rough. Like, <laughs> first, well, it was my. I done the Ulster Grand Prix. It was my first race, the fastest road race in the world. Like, I just straight in the deep end. And then, RMI never jumped a bike before in my life, and I'm jumping one at one hundred and fifty mile an hour. Ah, you know, but it, race, all right. it soon, it, it was amazing. It's just, it's it just, was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I think I qualified the back row or something. You know, back of the grid. But loved every you minute of it. I was yeah. just, this, this is it. This is it. You have to do it. Yeah, and I, I know I do, and it's, it's, like, Sammy, uh, leave the boy alone. I know, please, <laughs> Dad. <laughs> you know, like, at the end of the day, he knows it's my life ambition. My life ambition to do it. Yeah. And I've said to him before, there's two things in life I want. One is to win a road race, and two is to win a northwest. Yeah. Because he got sacked, and so I got to go one better than him. <laughs> that's that's the two things I want to do, and if I can tick one of them boxes, I'll be more than happy. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> look, it's one of those things that I'll wait till my time comes, whenever it may be. Mm-hmm. Maybe it mightn't be if they're all gone, but if I'm able to do it, yeah. And the races are still there, I'll be on them. You know, like I mean, I, I went to Cookstown this year, and I was just sitting there, and as much as I love the event, I love everything about it. I was so jealous. Yeah. I'm just sitting there watching it. Everyone was going, pew, pew, pew. And I'm sitting there going like, oh, I'm, I'm struggling here. See I'm, once, I'm struggling to watch this. See, once you do one, you'll you'll not go back to watch a road race. No? No. I, I've been in the Northwest a few times just to watch. Um, 
it's just end up turning my back yeah, to it and just having a drink don't, don't and having, yeah, yeah, just same with where were we? Cookstown a couple of times. Doesn't do it for me. Yeah, just no interest. It's a bit like you racing motocross and have yeah. no interest in the sport. No, I very rarely. I try and watch MotoGP or BSB. As I'd watch BSB yeah. over anything, but I wouldn't if it was on and I missed it. I you, would, you wouldn't care. No, it wouldn't really bother me. You, like, you know, if there wasn't anything else on TV, I would go to catch up during the week and play. It, I was like me. We at the minute, I'm sort of the opposite because in terms of roads, I've never done one. Mm-hmm. Anything that's on, I'm glued to. It. Yeah. I mean, at the minute, I've watched every minute of TT. You know, I've watched every minute of the Northwest, Cookstown, every every road race so far. Yeah. And maybe you're right. You know, by the time I end up doing one, it's gonna be like, all right, well, I don't care about watching it anymore. You know. Uh, yeah. yeah. But at, at the minute, I'm just glued to just wait until that 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 day eventually comes. Yeah. But hopefully, it's sooner rather than later. You know, I've spoken to that plenty of times about Armoy this year, not 300. So <laughs> now I can wear them down. I rate love the 300. You still have it, so yeah, it's still there. And I mean. I, I, I did upset him once because I texted Johnny about this. There was a while ago, whenever the entries came out, Johnny sat with him mm-hmm. and I filled out a fake one. Oh. <laughs> right? Now, I, I, I filled out a fake one. I didn't actually submit it, but I took screenshots of all the info and all the yeah. people, sent them to my dad, being like, entries in for our boy. <laughs> and he, he just replied, this is Drake Curran working, he just replied, why? And I was like, it's happening. Oh. <laughs> you, know, you know. Or was your dad being all spiritual and be like, you know, if he gives me a good enough reason, I might let him do it. To be honest, <laughs> I have a feeling like the way the way my dad knows me and knows how I ride a motorbike, mm-hmm. he's okay with it. He's, he's t- he said to me before, "You done a road race? I don't worry about. I'm not worrying about you. It's everyone around you." Mm-hmm. He goes, "You can go and do a road race, but I worry about the ones who be around you." And I go, "Well, what a TT then? Because I'm sitting off by himself, <laughs> <laughs> you know." <laughs> I, I think that's his fear because I think he knows that. I've got enough sense that I wouldn't go out and try and be ambitious or be stupid. No, I know. Just go out, feel it, enjoy it. Yeah. And you know, whatever happens, happens. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's my take on it. And I think he's been around me long enough. It's only been fifteen years at the end of the day. You know, then he knows what I'm like mm-hmm. and knows that I would probably be okay. I think my biggest issue is my mum. Yeah. Trying to trying to trying to get it around her. Like I mean, she's only ever watched one lap of me in the big bike ever. Is that right? And that was on Easter Easter Saturday. Mm-hmm. My eyes out for qualifying, first race in the big bike, uh, or well, first race meeting, sorry. And I flew by, got on my first lap qualifying, first time lap, and she saw it and goes, no. Just went back to the car. <laughs> you know, so, our, our man was like, I want to You know, so if she can't watch that on a oh, circle, yeah. how are you going to say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to go in between the hedges and stone walls here, by the way? Just don't tell her. <laughs> just, don't, just, just, just rock up. <laughs> Yeah. Tell him why you're watching there. I'm way next thing that just so hot when they put in that room. I done parade laps for years. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going for a parade Plenty lap here. Plenty of them. Oh, but listen, Rossi, fantastic having you on, and we wish you all the best for the future. Yeah, it's good being on. Yeah, first, first time did a proper podcast like this, so I have probably yeah. talked enough waffle, but sure. Not at all. Well, that's what we're here for. I, know. I, don't know. I only embarrassed myself once with getting that TT fact wrong, but I, I did fix it. I did fix it. Yeah, but we're not going to fix it, so it's staying in there. <laughs> <laughs> Dead on. Next one then, Temple. Isn't it a couple of weeks' time? Yeah, it's Kirk, uh, 14, 14, 14th, 15th of June. And just before that, Johnny Ray, I do apologise for getting your, your uh, year of the TT <laughs> wrong. That or that one there? That one there. <laughs> that one there. I did get it right second time, you know, second time round, but not the first one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, 14th, 15th of June, Kirkson, two days, so. Look forward to it. Mm-hmm. Plenty of tires burnt, plenty of fuel burnt. Hopefully, we can. There's a few wee things we're getting done at the minute in between this that Saturday round and this round coming up. Just set up the bike. Mm-hmm. So uh, hopefully, it's a bit more user friendly and yeah. my aim's just to go a bit faster. You know, and if I can, I can. If I can't, I can't. That's what it's about, isn't it? Listen, thanks very much, and we we'll thank yes, our sponsors thank as well, uh, Brap Moto, and massive thanks to Johnny and Glenn. Good lads, Phil Inc. Thanks very much for for having us here. And Rossi, wish you all the best, buddy. Thank you. And take it easy. Good lad.